and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. A moment of silence for the men and women in the armed forces, our first responders, and those poor souls that were passed away in the Milwaukee massacre. Thank you. Okay, this was a uh, notice of a public hearing, January 24th, 2022. There will be a community gathering to discuss and provide opportunity for input and suggestions concerning the Chenierski Bridge Project in New Milford. Uh, anyone not able to attend can send an email with any suggestions to the mayor at newmilford.org. I do have some that I'd like to give for the minutes. Uh, before we go into public uh, comment, I'd like to have Jack Healy, our DPW director, give us an overview of the project as it is today. Jack? Good evening, everyone. Um, where it is to today, I guess maybe the thing I should do is just start, just give you a real quick thing, is this started in 2017, the town went out, uh, the bridge has been evaluated um, and it, it is on a regular basis. Uh, it has a poor rate, it had a poor rating, the town went out for proposals on engineering firms, uh, the town went through its process, selected um, at the time a company called Anchor Engineering, which is now called Barton and Judas, in their proposal, I went through the file today, in their proposal, their original proposal was for a two-lane bridge, a double box culvert. They had gone through, uh, I believe, all the way through to 50% drawings at that, uh, on that bridge, and that was before I got here. When I arrived in town, I believe there was a stop on the design at that point. When I arrived, the mayor asked me if it was possible to do a single-lane bridge. We looked at it. Because the town was funding it and not the state, it was not grant-funded, we, have, we had some discretion in how we did that. I worked with Barton LeJudas. I had to send them a letter absolving them of the responsibility of, of a two-lane bridge and that a single-lane bridge, we would meet certain standards. Those standards were it'd be a single-lane bridge and it would have stop signs at each end and warning signs and whatever was required. Again, it was a double box culvert. Um, we went through the design. Of course, while we were in the middle of design, the, uh, the bridge began to fail. Um, we thought we could, we had a structural engineer come in and examine the bridge, um, found that it was failing. We put, a, we put steel plates on there. We talked to the mayor. We, we wanted to keep the bridge open, so we put steel plates on the bridge to keep it open and safe. Um, subsequent to that, we, 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 continued, we continued the design, working with the uh, design, design firm, and uh, we also continued to inspect the bridge regularly. At some point in December, I believe it was December of 2020, um, we noticed that the abutments were shifting. Uh, we found every almost daily parts of concrete that was falling off. You could see material coming from the cracks in the bridge. We again had a consulting engineer come in, structural engineer come in. Also, we, uh, excuse me, let me step back. We looked at the surface of the bridge underneath the, uh, the plates. The, this, the, the concrete deck was basically powder. Um, it, has, uh, it had got to the point where it was failing. Based on their recommendation, we closed the bridge in January of last, end of January of last year. Uh, I sent a letter to the Army Corps of Engineers asking for an emergency um, review of the design so that we could proceed with the, um, with the construction. To date, we have not received a response from them. We had gotten several emails that different reasons they hadn't looked at it, um, but we have not got a response. We continued through the, the final design. Um, I was expressing concern to the mayor about the bridge being closed. Um, we, had not had all our, we did not have all the permits in place. One of the reasons was you're waiting for Army Corps. Um, in the summer, I was expressing concern to the mayor in our meetings that the bridge was closed and that you know, if there was, a, if it was an emergency or something, you know, that you know, the bridge was closed and the detours are very long. The mayor, I believe, in September issued a emergency order. Um, we put the documents together, went out to bid. Um, there was a, uh, I, had, I got feedback from residents. I went up and met with residents up there who uh, did not like the idea of a double box culvert. The double box culvert is 
we had been originally proposed, and one of the reasons for double box culvert is for water handling. Um, when, you, when you build a bridge, you have to move the water. You can't just build with, with the water there. With a double box culvert, you, can put, you take the bridge out, you put one box in, you divert the water through that box, and you can put the other box in. Not doing that costs more money. The reason for a box culvert, they felt that structurally, that was, it, one, it's, it's less expensive. You can, you can build a box before and just set it in place. You don't have to make the forms and everything. And two, they felt it was a faster way of doing it. And structurally, there was concern about the soil structure there. Um, based on the feedback, the, the amount of, we also at that point st uh, started to form the Scenic Road Committee, which was required because Chinesky's a road is a scenic road. Um, I think we had one or two meetings, but then we, we stopped because at that point there was, I was getting, we were getting feedback about the, the bridge, the double box culvert, permits, feedback from, from some of the state people about it, concerned. So we, st I talked to the mayor and we stopped the design. Uh, any changes like that would have increased the cost of the bridge. I recommend to the mayor at that point, this bridge is eligible for a state grant. I recommend to the mayor, we go for a state grant. We have started to put those documents together. Um, I talked I I talk to the state, they felt it would, they said it would be eligible. The, the, the grant is, uh, is due to the state in March. Um, so we have begun putting those documents together. Um, we, have, we, have our, we already have our cost uh, preliminary application put together and preliminary cost figures. So that's where we are at this point. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, Sal, we have some residents that would like to address uh, the town council for the public meeting. Yes, my dear. Um, Peter Hall. Hello, I'm a 21 year resident and I'm impacted by the Chinerski Bridge. I'm sorry, and could you state your name? Peter Hall. Peter Hall. I live on Old Mine Road. And I'm impacted by the bridge and I would just hope that uh, the council would take the time to go through whatever procedures there are and need to be box checked to be sure that we're doing this properly for long term, keep our rural feeling and the one lane road and all that. Okay, that's Thank all you. I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a name, but I don't know how to read. It's not Baron, it's someone with J, I believe, who signed up as a second person. Ms. Is there a second person now that want to speak after Mr. Bartram or Ms. Bartram? No. Anybody else from the public wants to speak? I guess not. Okay. Yep. Before we do this, Randy, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, legally the courses that we've taken so far sure, yeah. with, the, with the bridge as we try to get this bridge fixed, but have run into some headwinds with the Army Corps of Engineers? Sure, we have. In uh, last summer, late last summer, the mayor, being a bit frustrated with the Army Corps of Engineers, issued an order pursuant to Title 21 of the statute. And in order, he did that in order to get around the Army Corps of Engineer issue regarding regarding the uh, the delay, and even reviewing the plan. He could do that. The problem is, is that once the state got involved, they would not. It wasn't a state issue. We, no matter what we did, we cannot get around the state permitting process or the wetlands process. We have to go through inland wetlands. Uh, the Supreme Court's told us that towns are subject to the Inland Wetlands Act. But we were trying to get around the, the, uh, the delay occasioned by the Army Corps of Engineers. In order to do that, he issued an executive order, but that was not gonna, that would have been okay for that one particular project. But since the project changed, it was not going to be eligible for state funds, but since the project changed, the bets are off. So when that change came, that executive order essentially was a nullity, and that's what happened. I don't know whose, whose decision it was to change the project from what 
the, the, the mayor had ordered. But the state intervened and would not, would not uh, agree to that. I think that's in a nutshell of what happened. Is that how it was, Jack? Yeah, that's, that's what, what occurred. So we tried to listen to the residents up there to get a one-lane bridge, which is what the residents thought I heard when, uh, when they came when I first became mayor, um, which would result in a double bolt box culvert, correct, Jack? Yes. Uh, then was some of the opinion of some of the residents up there to do a single lane culvert, right, Jack? Yes. The single lane culvert then resulted in what? Design and particularly the, the water handling. As I explained, when you have a double box culvert, you can move the water back and forth. So when you go to a, a single a single box culvert, it changes that, which increases the cost. Um, so that's when I came to the mayor and said, at this point, it's it's. Uh, advisable to go and get a state grant the bridge is eligible for state grant that will help us that will cover the increased cost of the bridge so jack so the public can understand the projected cost we had anticipated being six hundred thousand yep. by doing the double box culvert and keeping us a one lane bridge yep. when you're going to a single culvert what's the price going to be now well the, just for the culvert itself is nine hundred thousand in excess of nine hundred thousand then if you add in the incidentals um Construction, inspection, engineering, contingencies at about $1.2 million. So that's going to double the price. Okay. Katie? Jack, I just have a question. Did you say that just the box itself, the culvert, okay, is going to cost nine hundred? The the, installa the the installation of a single box culvert as opposed to a double box culvert, they expected the increase in price to go up to $900,000. So, if it was at six hundred thousand, it increased by about three hundred thousand more. Uh, some of that, a little bit of that, is because of cost increases to the materials. Thanks. And, and then, Jack, if we have to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Hillary. Uh, I was wondering if anybody could the environmental impact, the difference between the two. There are many. There have been a lot of studies. Um, I didn't go into the detail, but when the, when Barbara Judas originally in, uh, recommended a uh, double box culvert. DEP reviewed it. DEP would prefer to have a single box culvert. Mm -hmm. There were several emails and correspondence going back and forth between Anchor and DEP. Uh, Steve Gephardt is with DEP. I think Steve since retired. Steve gave them recommendations. It, at, at the end, it seemed like he was okay with the double box culvert as long as they staggered the culvert. When I say staggered, you had one at an upper, uh, low, higher elevation and one at a lower elevation that allowed for the, the migration of fish and, and, and turtles and mm -hmm. amphibians. So yes, there's been studies on that. Chris? Jack, how did we go from a double box culvert to a single? How did we get there? Because that changed everything. Yeah. Right? How did we get from a double box culvert to where we're at now, I believe, a single box culvert, which, which seemed to have changed everything? Well, it, the idea, the problem was is, or the, the, the issues coming back and forth were that there was a lot of input from the public and the people who lived there. They don't want a single box, double box culvert. They want a single box culvert. And they, they corresponded with several state uh, people at the state and local, um, other local municipalities about that. And they, they were citing the environmental studies, as you said here, but they, they did not want a double box culvert. They want a single box culvert. And, and did they? Did they order to the state or did they come to the town first? They, they believe they did. Well, there was correspondence between them and me, uh, their the residents. We have an email chain okay. that I send out to, or I'm part of for many of the people who live up there. Okay. And I went up and I sat and I, I spoke with John uh, Batista who lives there. And I met with other people up there about this. Um, and we, we discussed it and I explained to him about the, we can make modifications to the, to the, to the actual design of the bridge aesthetically. You know, whether right. or not you want wood bar guardrails and things, just like we did with Mud Pond. Structurally, the concern was, is that if you go to a structurally, if you change it from a double box to a single box, it changes the, the, amount, the way you, you install it. We were also considered about, con concerned about the, the stability of, the, of that, and uh, there was some geotechnic information that Anchor was concerned about, but mostly they were worried about the uh, water handling. I think I answered your question. Yes. The most environmentally uh, friendly um, bridge is a free-flowing bridge. So this is a double culvert is not free-flowing. Is that the case, or I think if, if DEP to, to 
said was exactly what they said. They would prefer a single box mm -hmm. culvert, or an, actually an open an open bridge. Right. Whether it's an open a single box culvert or just a poured bridge, they're okay with that. So are we so, back? So yes. I think to to answer uh, Councilman Ram's question is when you're looking at a single culvert versus a double culvert. Another thing that we wanted to keep in in. Uh, in the thought process as well is what the residents who live in that area what their wishes were which was they wanted a single lane bridge mm -hmm. by going to a single culvert the price goes almost double by getting a state grant and jack can correct me if i'm wrong we then now have to go to what's called ashto standards ashto standards jack could you let the council know if we have to go to ashto standards yeah. now what happens when you when you accept the money from the state you have to you have to follow their criteria because they're funding the bridge yeah, just much like Mud Pond. When you once we do that, and I correspond with Francis, Francisco Fadul and also Mark Burns at the state, and they confirmed this, that the bridge would have to then go to a 1.2 times the, the width of the, of the stream, and also it has to be a double a double lane bridge. It has to be 22 feet wide. It kind of takes away the rural nature of the area. And are we back at the mercy of the Army Corps of Engineers again? No? Well, you have to go through the whole permitting process again. Oh, God. So yep. I have talked to the mayor. We are try I'm actually got Anchor working on, on this. We're trying to do a lot of this work as we go. I put a, an email into, this, into the state saying that we're, we're trying to proceed with this. Uh, we will follow up with a, with a, um, with a grant application in March. We're, we're preparing already. Okay. Well, we have a lot of things to consider. Um, is there a rush to making a decision tonight about what we want to do next? The sooner, I mean, yeah. we're, we're at the point we're trying to, we're, we're, we're going on a, on a, to apply for the grant. We need to make a decision quickly. I mean, we've, we've talked about this. Um, I need to get all the documents in place, spend money to, to have the documents and, and preliminary design stuff ready to go in for an application. And the big issue we're facing now, especially when talking with the Northville fire chief, if there happens to be a emergency issue up there, as we all know, that's a, like a five mile detour. So it's very important that we, how, whatever we decide, that we need to make this happen for these residents. I mean, this bridge has been closed for way too long and just to stagmire with an Army Corps of Engineers, it's just, it's, it's a nightmare to say the least. Am I correct, Jack? Yes. I guess I would just raise the environmental and as that is the West Aspatuck, a double A, you know, it's one of our most precious bodies of water. So I would say that, you know, with this influx of money, these funds, so we've offset some other things, this might be an area where, you know, we can make up that, I don't know, but that's So you've seen uh, on our agenda uh, was the 600,000 mm -hmm. for art funds to help defray the cost of the bridge. If I may, Mayor, just, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I'd like you to. Um, we have, a, it's not exactly akin, and in, in, forgive me if you already know about it, but the Tamarack pipe replacement is somewhat similar to this. And we went on, again, I'm, I'm into my, almost my third, finished my third year, and that started before I got here. And we were able to take that at one point. This is, this is a pipe now. If you go up to, up to Tamarack, you really don't see the, the bridge. It's just a pipe under, under, the, wall, under the road. Um, and originally, Army Corps had told us we had to put in a bridge, a, a, a concrete structure bridge, a box cover. Again, when I first got here, the mayor asked if we could look at it, and we reduced it down to an aluminum pipe. Uh, we, have, we have the size. We, went, we were able to bring it down a little smaller, and we had it all designed, ready to go out to bid. And then DEP asked us to go out and look for, a, a, I think it was a box, it was a certain type of turtle. We found out the turtle didn't exist there. They asked me to do a historic study on the pipe. Now this is an aluminum pipe, an old steel pipe that was thrown in at some point. And then DEP actually came out and told me that the, what I was putting in was too small and that I was restricting the water and it was gonna harm the wetlands and asked me to raise the road. And we, we finally said, you know, listen, we, we need to get this done because the pipe's failing. And we went back and forth and they approved what we, we, we did with some modifications, they approved our design. What I was trying to address is your concern. We do go back and forth with the environmental design with DEP. This is not like a, a one lane thing where we just, we just go forward. It's, it's an interactive process. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I definitely would like to support um, 
environmental efforts, here we have a chance to do something right. And um, we had a number of letters come to us. We do. Um, yes. So are they going to be entered into They're going to the be record? entered not only into the public hearing, but also this is on the agenda for council. For, yeah, council so. for both as well. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So um, the other is um, I'm hearing that it, it was a thoroughfare for trucks going between 202 and Route 7. And my concern is if it's a double bridge, it's going to be really bad. And um, that certainly is not going to meet anyone's needs. And, and that's a big concern. So the 600000 that you're looking for, do you want to talk about that later? Or yes, because that, okay. that would be on that's, our agenda for the okay. ARP funds. Okay. Again, to, if I may, Mayor? Absolutely. Um, I, what the residents did ask me about that, and we went through to the uh, traffic authority, because there's a way of you know, making a no through truck designation. We, we, uh, we went to the traffic authority, they approved the request. We sent the request to the state um, offices the OSTA, Office of State Traffic Authority, it was denied. So we are, we can't, we can, they, they, only they can designate that, we cannot. They don't delegate that to the local traffic authority. So we have, we are looking at ways of, but at that point, that's one of the efforts we did make. So Jack, just so the public itself can hear one more time that's watching on TV, we did go to the state traffic authority Yes. To ask for that, and they were told, we were told by them. It was, our request was denied. Denied. Yeah, we cannot make that a no through truck road. No. Thank you. Thank you. And if it's okay with the council, normally when we, public participation is, has ended, we kind of stop. But this is a public hearing, and we do, I see some residents that would like to address the council, if that is okay. Yep. Yep. You can just state your name and address when you address so, the council, please. I'm John Batista from the oh, Chernesky Road. I sent all of you, the mayor and everybody on town council, the letter that said that probably one of the leading geotechnical engineers said that the idea that the soil samples called for a box culvert is bogus. The problem isn't just a single box culvert versus a double box culvert. It's a four-sided box, box culvert. Four-sided box culverts are the least desirable environmental way to go to a river passing because they call, because they tend to fail, and a double form of it, they tend to clog. So what we wanted all along was a bridge like we already have, a free-flowing Chernisky Road bridge, you know, <clears throat> 1.2 times that is the environmental standard that is just kind of universally accepted. And of course, I don't know that we know exactly what the cost of that, but it has to be poured in place. And that's different. But believe me, taking a 21 foot box culvert, whether it's three sided or four sided, and putting it down there and putting it in, that's its own nightmare. Think about what's happened at Mud Pond. You know, the thing cracked. The roads are not meant for this kind of thing. Now, I don't know what else to say, but I try to write out the whole story there. And uh, I'm pretty sure and you see that it's supported by a wide variety of people on the road. And I think pretty much everybody's in uh, agreement that this would be the best solution. I understand that there are financial implications, but you know, this is probably the finest river in the state of Connecticut right at this point. So take that under consideration, please. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address? Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening, it's Adrian Arricchio. I live on Chernisky Road, um, 72. Just to, because not everybody here knows the whole story of this bridge. Um, we know over the last 10 years or more since the advent of iPhones and Android phones and mapping, online mapping, has increased the traffic on that road to the point that the monster tractor trailers that are just going through from Massachusetts over to New York State, they're not 
stopping in Connecticut. They're not spending their money. There's no businesses on that road from New Preston to Gaylordsville or over to New York State. There's no business. It's all residential. So they are impacting the infrastructure. And so one of our concerns is why we all gathered as a group on the road was because we are getting tired of the traffic and we want to preserve the rural, ca rural character of the area. Plus, you're spending all this money bonding for roads. It's going to just rip them apart. It's not just our road. It's happening all over town. Detours by car carriers. Have you seen a car carrier go down the road that doesn't go? There's no car dealers anywhere 10 miles in either direction or more. I've seen them eight cars, brand new cars on giant car carriers going down that road. So as a result of all that traffic, the bridge broke. Basically, it just broke. Maybe it was going to be replaced at some point. It was built in 1930, but it lasted a really long time. And I don't see why we don't just invest in it now, do it the right way. And, and one of our reasons for wanting the single lane like it is now was to not increase traffic. We don't want more traffic. And I would think environmentally that you wouldn't want to increase emissions. We are facing climate change. I think everybody here understands that. We see the amount of rain we're getting, huge amounts, five to seven inches in an hour. You know, the Arctic is melting, the Antarctic is melting. Why would we want to increase emissions by making a wider bridge? So if it means that you have to bond it, like you're bonding roads all over town, then just bond it, but do it the right way. Because if you don't do it the right way, it's just going to make everybody pissed off, and it's going to destroy the roads. Those, those roads cannot handle those giant trucks, not in any way, shape, or form. So that's my feeling. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else would like, like to address? Yes, ma'am. I'm uh, Justine McCabe. I live at 88 Chernivsky Road, right at the bridge. And we've um, been... It's been difficult living with it as it is, but we're definitely, I think all of my neighbors would agree that we would rather have this done properly than do something quick. We've, we've waited this long. What I would really like ask pointedly is why there is not a, the option of what we want, what we've looked at, what we've researched. My husband, John Batista, has talked to a soil uh, scientist and who says the soil is perfectly fine, the, le the kind of cement that we have today could support that bridge, you know, to replace it as it was. Why isn't there an estimate, at least, of replacing it as it is with a modernized version, an open span bridge, with you know that has built in place the the concrete? I would really uh, request, as a person who is affected by what happens, that you have a, an actual you know estimate for that, as well as the other ones that you seem to be. Um, pushing for. So I, I really request publicly that you have that kind of assessment made. Thank you. You're welcome. Jack, did we get a estimate on this type of construction or can we get that? We can in that Because um, right now we're in the preliminary design phase. Of, you know, they, we, what we're working off of is that I asked the consultant to go back to their original design work and the information they had since they had designed, you know, worked on a double lane bridge before. And I asked them, to, you know, to give me a single, a single span bridge, a single span box culvert. I, it doesn't take much more for them to do the calculations and give me that estimate. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else that would like to come before the public hearing? Yes, sir. My name is Chris Renberg. I live on, well, Frenchman, Shinisky, the bridge. Um, all I gotta say is that the Frenchman's Road can't handle the traffic anymore. It just can't handle it. Uh, the other thing I can say is that there's a lot of people, minus the three neighbors that spoken, that want it done as fast as possible. I've given up with trying to make it a two-lane bridge don't care. Don't care if it's one lane bridge, don't care if it's two lane bridge. But as you guys always do, you guys always look to not what's today, but 80 years from now. The last bridge was put in 55, not 1930s. Uh, it's got to be able to last 80 years. The whole, no farms will be in the valley in that in 80 years from now. It will be a suburb. That's all I got to say. 
Anyone else who would like to address the public meeting? Okay. I'd like to make a motion to close. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending tonight's public meeting. We're going to be, what time we got? All right. We're going to move right into our town council meeting. Yeah, I think it's just the date. We just gotta put the Andrew, I'm gonna put you first. Uh, okay. Mr. Fella, how's it going? How do you like the uh, climate change? Global, war global, global warming. How do you like the global warming? Can we all rise for the pledge? Can we all rise for the pledge? Councilman Fail, can you lead us in the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a moment of silence for the men and women in the armed forces, our first responders, those poor souls that lost their lives in the Milwaukee tragedy. Thank you. Sam? Sal, can you read off the names for us? Yes, my um, Andrew Harvey. <coughs> Good, we're here again. Good evening. I'm Andrew Harvey, resident of Long Mountain Road, one of the residents' representatives of the recent LMR Scenic Road Committee, and author of the Minority Report in your document packet for tonight. I've stood here before to warn this council of a town decision-making process that has lost its way, and here I am once again. It speaks to a larger issue, but the immediate manifestation is a recommendation to add double center lines to the full length of the paved section of Long Mountain Road, as per the report from the Scenic Road Committee that you will address later in this meeting. You'll hear, you'll hear that this decision was made on the basis of safety in spite of the significant federal traffic safety research to the contrary for a road with this traffic volume. 
this repeated claim of safety was made to support the adding of lines, although the DPW failed to provide any applicable safety research to support their opinion. This recommendation will make Long Mountain Road more dangerous. The acknowledged increase in traffic speeds that comes with lined roads was brushed aside. The safety of pedestrians and other non-motor vehicle road users was ignored. The safety of pedestrians, I sorry, went through that. The opinion of the majority of residents was dismissed. It was an extremely disappointing display and not in any way in line with the professionalism, fairness and commitment that I've experienced in my other interactions with other town bodies, including, I'm quick to add, other interactions with the DPW. There are some people, some people in this room who would say, why is he still on about this? This decision has been made, it's a done deal. Well, that attitude speaks to the very heart of this issue and explains why I am here. Because it was intended and planned that this was a done deal long ago and that every point of oversight and approval saw it as a done deal on arrival. The recommendation that you'll hear tonight was locked in place months before the Scenic Road Committee was formed to consider residents' views on the issue. It was buttressed with a series of circular rulings from other town committees, which were based on seat of the pants opinion, not traffic safety research. At every step through the process, be it the traffic authority meetings, conversations with appointed committee members or the town council itself, we've seen a rubber stamping of the director of D the DPW's opinion. No one has been prepared to consider alternatives or even ask him to explain his reasoning. It is about safety, and that has just been accepted on faith. On the flip side, the director of the DPW nominally defers to the higher authority of whichever committee he's making recommendations to. What happens if he gets it wrong? Under this approach, the director is a single point of failure, which is a highly risky way to make safety decisions. Perhaps he and the town are protected under the town's insurance. But that is cold comfort to we residents and road users who have to bear the real life risk to our safety and that of our loved ones. In addition to this, there was the decision to decline the resident's request of a section of Merritt's Parkway spec wood and steel guide rail, which was the only option in keeping with the philosophy spelled out in the Scenic Road Preservation Ordi Ordinance on the basis of an incremental cost of about $8,000. The same week, starting less than half a mile down the road, a private landscaping contractor was being paid $29,000 of taxpayer money to refinish the verge in front of two private homes, including rollout turf at the end of November. While this does not have the same safety implications of the earlier issue, it does make it very difficult to believe that we residents and taxpayers are considered through the same lens. In fact, it smacks of cronyism, favoritism, and punishing those who disagree. This meeting of the town council is the last chance for the town to sense check this process, to stop the rubber stamping and stop the real world safety mistake from being cemented in place. Later tonight, the mayor will propose a scenic road advisory committee. If this goes ahead and has effective authority, a problem like the one on Long Mountain Road could perhaps be avoided, but that will be too late for the residents of LMR in this case. Please look at the safety research, the data, the federal guidance, and consider your role of oversight in this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Levin, or Levin. Mr. Mayor, council members, Andrew colleagues sitting here, Jeremy Levin, 31 Hind Road. I am one of the original authors of the Scenic Road Ordinance. That ordinance was developed at a time when in fact this town was undergoing massive assault by unbridled development. There was necessity to develop many parts of, this of the town, and indeed much was done that was actually quite good. However, many of the roads were simply seen as vehicles for ways to develop parcels of land, and by doing that, they simply proceeded to destroy much of the rural character of this town. The Scenic Road Ordinance was brought to its fruition in part, many of you here who've lived just as long as I have, 30, 40 years, know this town for what it was. A beautiful rural part, an industrial center, mountains, and a long corridor down to Danbury. 
the scenic road ordinance wasn't designed to prevent development. It was designed to preserve and to contain the beauty of this town. The steps that have been taken that Andrew has outlined give me pause for concern, and I hope it gives you pause for concern. The very design of the future of this town depends, rests in your hands. As we look at data, for example, on safety, I would venture to guess that if we took every mile of road in this town and asked how many accidents have occurred on it, the minimalist would be on the scenic roads. That data has not been presented, as a consequence of which claims of liability presented as a reason for doing the changes that have been seen have to be questioned. I am completely data driven. I'm completely open to anything that shows that there is a danger and that we should protect against it. However, assertions, assertions of danger leading to liability is not a legal grounds for changing the ordinance or for doing the kinds of changes that we have seen. I appeal to the council to consider very carefully what we're trying to accomplish here. Are we trying to change the nature of the town or are we actually trying to conserve the very best that is within it? And I want to make it very clear, I applaud DPW. I do believe they do a superb job in a difficult circumstance. So this is not about them. This is about the council's responsibility to retain the beautiful characteristics of this town, the diverse characteristics of this town, which makes it so unique, and the plan that the town has actually put forward already to conserve that diversity will be eroded by these types of decision. So I leave it in your hands, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Sam? Um, Ms. Ms. Leah? I, no, no. Um, my name is Lee Gill and I'm from Butterbrook Hill. Um, I haven't appeared before the town council in a couple of years anyway, but I just had to say this. Um, for nearly two years, the pandemic has affected par public participation, due process, and limited information on our town government. This administration uses pandemic public cautions as your cover. It's a poor excuse to limit public input on spending town and ARPA funds. The town council in executive sessions that are undocumented in private effectively seals the control of the town. Your actions have not gone unnoticed and may well prove your fearic victory. The ARPA funds, 7.6 million, really are not your windfall fund to spend. The significant pandemic relief money is intended to benefit all the new Milford community. You denied us formal resident surveys, even a referendum to vote on how to best spend the $7.6 million fund. You neglected the opportunity to fund the long ignored uh, Pettibone community improvements you disdain. ARPA funds are the town's last best opportunity to fund an indoor pool. Serves everybody, gets the kids off the streets. I mean, it's healthy, I mean, you know? At the least, you should fund needed mental health initiatives for the Board of Ed. Kids are hurting. We all know it. They've been affected far more than adults, really. You made the spending decisions. The community you really are required to work for has been shut out. You indulged your favored wants over long ignored community needs. The ARPA funds are not your fund for political payback nor reviving long failing private clubs. ARPA funds are not intended for you to manipulate and cut the town budget. Necessary operating expenses for IT, police and fire departments do belong in the town budget, not to be 
taken from AARP funds. They're not as line items paid by ARPA. I ask you to take a good look at your Achilles heel. People are watching. Thank you. Mr. Michael. May I take my mask off? Sure. <coughs> Is it okay with the council? Yes. Thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. My name is Mike Anastas. I live on Lake Point Drive, and uh, I want to address town property. The Republican-led government in New Milford needs to form a nonpartisan committee to examine the stewardship of our undeveloped properties. For example, the East Street School would cost over a million dollars to make safe. Dakota Partners offered to purchase it for a million six and converted it into much needed housing that I would love to live in and that would greatly increase our tax base. That was in 2019 and nothing has happened on that issue since. The E Street School, uh, 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 I, I participated in a community study conducted by Perry Associates in 2019, and it was financed by a grant from the State Historical Preservation Office. The E Street School report was never published. After months of trying to get a copy of the draft, I am filing a Freedom of Information Act to request the report of the study in which I participated. Another valuable and underutilized property is the Pettibone Community Center. It represents an enormous potential to serve the community, but it's being allowed to deteriorate with insufficient funding and maintenance. We call that demolition by, <laughs> by ignoring. This is an injustice. Town Council should make certain that Pettibone is maintained and improved as a resource as many other communities have done with their uh, uh, former school properties. Something's going on here and we would like to know what it is that affects these valuable properties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Paul Murphy. Yeah. Paul Murphy, 15 Buckboard Lane in New Milford. Mayor Bass, town council members, good evening. At the last town council meeting, a small group of military veterans attended in person while numerous ones watched on the live feed video with family and friends. Myself and two other veterans spoke on behalf of the concerning the disrespect by council member Lundgren in not allowing a military preference on an application for a social worker position. The veterans requested a formal apology for all the veterans, past, present, and future, from the council member. And we are here tonight, again, to receive that apology. However, Ms. Lundgren, for the second meeting in a row, has failed to appear. I'd like to hand out a piece of We also requested that at the same time the council member who chairs the Democrat Town Committee apologize for the campaign mailer sent to homes throughout New Milford, somehow insinuating that the Republican citizens were followers of the Nazi party with raised arm salutes. This was disgraceful, alarming, and a total embarrassment to the town of New Milford. Second page. Over one million United States military, army, and army airmen, Navy, and Marines were killed or wounded during World War II fighting against the Axis powers, which the German Nazi party was part of. 
This victory by brave men and women, some of which are li forever listed on the walls of this very town hall, have given each and every one in this room and watching on the cameras here the freedom you have today and the ability for you council members to be elected and sit in these chairs. We not only come forth to bring council member Lundgren to task, but the rest of the members of the town citizens that should have raised up in protest as a whole to condemn the campaign material spread by the TDC. The veterans expect apologies this evening, which we will not get, and will leave upon receiving the same. In this case, we're gonna be back next meeting, and we'll be back the next meeting after that, and we will monitor everything that this council does in any type of disrespect to an American veteran. And mark my words, we will be back. In closing, the veterans of the Milford will not tolerate any disrespect and will monitor closely the actions of the council administration to ensure the veterans' rights and rights of all the citizens we fought for. Thank you for your time and patience. Good evening, Jeff McBriarty, uh, 288 Kent Road. The first part of my remarks will be as a veteran of this town and of the United States. Uh, the, to clarify the ill-informed of the community on some people that spoke about the VFW being a water hole on the New Milford Strong site. The veterans of foreign wars, formerly the veteran of foreign wars of the United States, is an organization of U.S. war veterans who as military service members fought in wars, campaigns, and expeditions on foreign land, water, or space. Across America, the initials VFW are a familiar sight and symbolize a commitment to the nation both home and abroad. Our mission to foster camaraderie among United States veterans of overseas conflicts, to serve our veterans, the military, and our communities to advocate on behalf of all veterans. The second organization, the American Legion's mission statement, as adopted by the National Executive Committee, is to enhance the well-being of American veterans, their families, our military, and our communities by our devotion to mutual helpfulness. These are veterans who did not serve in a war or conflict, but served their country honorably. Neither one of them, Andrew B. McGatt, post-1672 VFW, or Ezra Woods, post-31 American Legion, are watering holes, as stated on the New Milford Strong site, by individuals who are members of that site. The two ladies involved should either do their homework about the organizations or watch TV. Now I'm taking my hat off and I'm speaking now as a private citizen of this town. Not as a veteran and not as the commander of the American Legion, but a private citizen. As a private citizen, I have a right as a constituent of this town to speak my piece. And this thing that I wrote and read last meeting is directed at the director or chairman of the DTC. Keep your thoughts positive because your thoughts become your words. Keep your words positive because your words become your behavior. Keep your behavior positive because your behavior becomes your habits. Keep your habits positive because your habits become your values. Keep your values positive because your values become your destiny and your legacy. And with that, that being said, right or wrong or indifferent, I am asking the chairperson of the DTC to resign from the town council or apologize for the comments about veterans and their worth for job openings in the town and for the flyer with a person with a raised hand like a Hitler salute. This is an insult to the veterans of the World War II and this country, and it's a shameful act did it have to in include that in something like that? And the, the lady that I uh, directed this 
resignation from is not here again tonight and will show up every night until she does. Doesn't matter if it's two years. We're going to be here every meeting until she shows up and, and we're going to request an apology or she needs to resign from the town council. Thank you very much. Mr. David Lawson. Good evening, everybody. Chris, okay. tough one. What can I say? <laughs> uh, I'm here tonight to speak about the um, parks and recreation. The fees are on number 14. Dave, just your address, please. Uh, 16, White Swan Drive, New Milford, Connecticut. I feel like I'm doing calling a credit card or a bank or something, you know, for <laughs> authorization. Um, <laughs> Uh, on number 14 with the parks and uh, recreation fee schedule uh, in prior meetings that when I was on the town council I brought up the idea to have senior citizens get a free pass to our parks um, you asked me you know uh, how does that work how do we pay for it well we have a number of ways to pay for it we have the undesignated fund sitting around what 20 million I think it's around there we have the um, landfill settlement that's designed for that purpose that should be around 11 12 million and then we have the ARPA funds the senior citizen pass program I think we should at least try it for a year or two and 6,500 6, tops uh, I was quoted at 6,000, but uh, I think we should give it a serious go. Uh, it's part of the mental health, part of benefiting another constituency of our community. And uh, I thank you for your time. I hope you have a serious discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you, David. I don't have more names on the list, ma'am. Thank you. Katie? Great. Uh, we'll move on to um, item number three, consent agenda. I'd like to move to accept items 3A and 3B. Second. Any discussion on the consent agenda? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Um, as we move into the appointments and reappointments and some other things, I want to just, if this is acceptable, by the council, I would like to ask, oh, there are several clerical errors. I'll just run through them so we don't have to stop at each place. Um, if you start with page two, you'll see that the dates, the year, instead of 2022, if you look down the column, you'll see there are some that say 2020 under Alarm Appeals Board. Uh, then you can come down to Arts and Commissions. The last one the year isn't 21. We're not, it's, uh, it's not the month 21, it's the, I'm sorry, it's not the year 21, it's the month two for February. If you go to page three, you'll note the same thing under housing partnership. The uh, year is says 2020 for some of them. They should all be 2022. Uh, the address for Pete Bass should be uh, 10 Main Street, not 120 Main Street. If you go to uh, page four. What about, okay, what about inland wetlands? Excuse me? What about inland wetlands? This is 20 as well. Yes, any of them. I, I, okay. Do you want me to read them all? No, I mean, that's I why I was trying to no, do this, to have no. to get away from that. Gotcha. Um, the, uh, I'll do that if you like. Uh, on page four, Parks and Rec, there's a, an omission of a, a member that should be on here for reappointment. It's Alfred Esposito, 8 Rabbit Lane term February 1st, 2020 to January 31st, 2026, like the rest of the people. I'm sorry, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm reading, <laughs> there's so many of them. Um, and then if we move down to pension committee, um, Raymond Jankowski should be removed uh, as a, a member here for, uh, to be voted on. At the bottom of the page, or down a riverfront, you'll notice that the ending uh, date for their two-year term. It should read January 31st, 2024 for all of them. At the very bottom of page four, under youth agency, 
Uh, Maureen Price, the beginning term is February 1st of 2022. Move forward to page uh, five and we have a uh, removal of item 11 that will be uh, taken off the agenda. And at the very bottom of the page under the ARPA funds, you'll see the uh, police department for medical kits and defibrillators. That number should be $10,246.88, not 190. What's the total amount? $10,246.88. Okay, so um, if that's acceptable by the council, we'll just note these clerical errors and uh, I will continue. Is that acceptable with everybody? Yes. Okay, so now I'd like to move the following appointments and reappointments. And would the council like to do each one separately or may I do the do them all together. I'm fine with doing them all. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'd like to move that we accept the following appointments and reappointments as noted for it. I'll just give the committee name so that our uh, recording secretary knows what I'm talking about. The first would be the 9 11 committee. Then we have the aging commission. And I'm sorry, there's another clerk later. I'm sorry. Uh, I need to add on to the aging commission two people that were left off. We have an unaffiliated Deborah Wilcox. Her term would be the same, February 1st, 2020, ending January 31st, 2026. 2022, start. Oh, geez, excuse me. Do you have her address, Katie? I haven't a clue where she okay. lives. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to so get back to you with that. Right. Uh, and we'll also add on the aging commission uh, under as a D, Robert Bennett, uh, term of February 1st, 2022 to January 31st, 2026. It is 26 that they go to. Okay, has everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're adding those two people. Then uh, continuing with the appointments and reappointments, Alarm Appeals Board, Arts, Commission of the Arts, Candlewood Lake Authority, Ethics, Commission, Farmland and Forest Preservation Committee, Film Commission, Housing Code Enforcement Committee, Housing Partnership, and we had one uh, note of the, the dates, the start dates of February 1st, should be 2022. Inland Wetlands Commission Aquifer Protection, again, the starting dates, February 1st, 2022, for all three members. Library Board of Trustees, Municipal Building Committee. Moving to page four, Municipal Citation Hearing Officer. Municipal. Okay, Municipal Roads <laughs> Committee. <laughs> From the heavens, the more ads. Okay, Municipal Roads Committee, Northville One Room Schoolhouse Committee. Parks and Recreation, uh, that I added, Alfred Esposito, 8 Rabbit Lane. They all begin February 1st, 2022 and end at January 31st, 2026. The Pension Committee, uh, as shown, minus Raymond Jankowski. Riverfront Revitalization Committee. Uh, on this, just note that the ending of the term is January 31st, 2024 for all of them, not 25. Sewer Commission, no change. Traffic Authority, no change. Youth Agency, note that uh, Ms. Price, her term begins February 1st, 2022. Moving to page five. Uh, that is the Sporks Complex. Oh, I'm sorry, nope, that's a new nope, item. So new there one. we end as, uh, as I read with the uh, clerical issues re remanded and taken care of. That's my motion. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we have a second. Any discussion on the motion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you Thank very you. much for Thank doing you. it that way. It saved us a lot of time. Um, and now I'll move forward to motion for the following item, which would be, I have to go all the way back. What is it, 4? Four? 4B? Four 3B. Golly. 
Please. Please. do this way again. Uh, I'd like to move on item 3B, uh, the formation of a sports complex feasibility temporary subcommittee with members being Robert Beebe, Thomas Pilly, Pilla, Doug Skelly, John Wren, and Chris Cosgrove. This committee is not complete. There will be people added. The term for this committee would begin February 1st of 2022 and go forward to July 31st of 2022. July 1st. Wow. It says August, but I have a change that was written in here. It should be July. Which would it be, Mayor? Uh, six months. Six be. months. Yeah, so, so okay. So it'd be 731. 731, 2022. All right. For the end. That is my Any, motion. Is there a second? Do I have a second? Oh, Alex. Is there, any cost on feasibility? is there any cost to that feasibility studies? No, it's pure volunteer. That's all volunteers. Thank you. Yeah. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. So anybody, if other people want to be added to that one, they yes. can just see you. Yes. Yes. Item number four, um, we have a report from the uh, youth, the New Milford Student Advisory Board uh, leadership representatives under the youth agency. Are they here? Ah, there there we are. go. As we had uh, talked to the council before, we're very happy to have our youth agency uh, leadership board. They're going to come in and present to us um, every other month, once a month? Um, once a month. Once a month, all right. Okay. They're going to report to us back on some youth, and then they're also going to be. Uh, with the permission of the council going to be here also to see how we as a council interact uh, with our public as well so thank you okay hello everyone my name is jessica wang i am 16 and i'm a junior in high school so third year in high school um i am representing the student advisory board today and from now on we'll try to represent a variety of interests and backgrounds we will meet monthly to discuss current youth issues and serve as a resource to the town council we wanted to keep the free first meeting brief for, brief for introductions, but open it up for any questions that you may have or need us to research for the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. Jessica, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank so you. great to see you. Thank and you And I'd just like me. to ask you, how has it been so far being on an advisory board? Um, I think I've learned a lot and I've gotten many opportunities like this. So thank you. Great. Look okay. forward to seeing you every month. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you. Any Good other questions for Jessica? I'm Kathy Jackson. I'm the youth advocate for the uh, youth, youth agency. agency. Thank you. Jessica, I want to thank you. Kathy, thank you for being here as well. Thank you. I want to thank you and the advisory group for really partnering with us and really talking to us in the future about things affecting our youth here in New Milford. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, item five, uh, I'd like to move that the council go into executive session and inviting in Tom Pilla, David Lawson, Walter Bayer, uh, Greg Bolero, and attorney Randy DeBella. A second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So to the public, we're going into executive session, and then... Uh, we'll call you back. Exactly. Thank mm -hmm. you.
for everybody. We gotta wait for Mike. He's gonna. Are we on, Mike? Okay. Okay. Like to call this meeting back to order. No motions or. No motions were made Thank or you. votes taken during the executive session. Okay. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to suspend the rules to add uh, to our agenda uh, uh, two items, and I guess we would make those uh, items 5A and 5B. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Uh, item 5A is that I'd like to move that we accept the following um, update change to our pension plan as follows. As of March 1st, 2022, all non-union new hires will enter into a 403B retirement plan rather than the current defined pension plan. The town will fund 5% of the employee's base pay with a 2% minimum matching contribution from the employee. As of July 1st, 2022, the following pension changes will become effective for employees enrolled in the town's defined pension plan. Employee pension benefit will be calculated on the average of employee base pay in the last five years of service within the first 30 years of service, multiplied by a factor of 2.0, which was an increase from the current multiplying factor of 1.6. Additionally, the employee shall contribute 2% contribute of base pay into the town defined pension plan. All calculations are determined by base pay only. <laughs> Earnings past 30 years of service will not be considered in the calculation of pension benefits. Part-time employees and part-time service shall not be eligible for pension benefits. If an employee leaves town service prior to vesting, which is 10 years, all contributions will be returned to the employee. Employees must attain the age of 65 years before pension benefits become available. The employee may continue to work past 30 years of service with no additional pension benefit. Employees working beyond 30 years will no longer contribute 2% of their salary. And along with this, I'd like to say that any employee who wishes to remain in the defined, any current employee who wants to remain in the defined pension plan as it exists now can do that. Uh, or as we implement the 403B retirement plan, they may select that as well. Is there a second to the lengthy motion? Second. Okay. <laughs> any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank okay. you. Uh, item 5B, I would like to move that the town council adjust the office of the mayor's salary to increase it from $85,504 to $103,504, effective uh, on July 1st, 2022. This would be included in the budget that is upcoming for the year 2022-2023. And it would be voted on by the legislative body being the residents along with the budget. Second. I can't, I have to recruit myself because no. you guys are talking about me, so it has to be the vice okay. chair. Pardon? Um, okay, a lot, well, this is just for this. That's a separate, separate thing. This is a changing of the salary. Just want to comment that the salary was has not been increased since what was it, Katie? Um, uh, yes, in the last ten years there has been no increases in the mayoral compensation, and in the last fifteen years the average raise for our mayors has been a whopping five hundred and twenty-four dollars per year. Per year. So am I? Am I embarrassed for us in our town? Yes. Uh, I have to tell you that I really and truly was very embarrassed to find that nothing has been done in the last 10 years. It's, it's really terrible. But here we are. We are taking it upon ourselves to make this motion. And uh, the council uh, can approve. That's what we're here to vote for because the mayor doesn't have a department head. It has, he has us. And it will become part of the budget 
so that the residents can vote on it like they do every other part of the budget. So that's my motion. And Mr. Crasgrove has seconded it. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, Council. Okay. Now you've got to really get to work. All right. Next is an update from Dr. Levin. Doctor? And uh, we sent out Dr. Levin's um, update to everyone. I hope you got it. Yep. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor. When I uh, have Council, to thank you very much. Fairly slim data today, but I'd like to focus on a couple things. Uh, for those who are listening in, we're heading towards the million dead in the United States. We're at right now 860. That's increasing roughly 2,000 per day. So no matter what, I think we're... That's the bad news. The good news is that the current seven-day moving average is actually slowing down. And so what we're seeing now is we seem to be getting to the back end of the latest spike. The better news is that, and I'll keep on reiterating this, is that we have absolute incontrovertible data that if you're vaccinated, your chances of being hurt or damaged or going into hospital are infinitely less, somewhere like one-tenth of that of somebody who's not vaccinated. And so there's little doubt on that. And so our vaccination doses and the way it's looking right now is very good. Those who've had the first two shots are close to a totally, rough, uh, roughly about 250 million have had a dose. Those who've had two doses, about 210 million. And it's superly good on the above 65 year old where you've got nearly 88% of the nation vaccinated. That is not the case, though, in all cases around the country. In Southern California, uh, sorry, in uh, Florida and several in the Midwest and several other states, we're seeing an enormous rise uh, in cases. But overall, cases are looking like they're trending downwards. Latest research from on global totals are completely unknown. I reiterated it last time. We simply don't know. There is an estimate that last week 19 million more people were infected. Actually, this is just pie in the sky. The, great, the estimate now is that close to 30 million people are dead globally, but there's no good figures on this because only the Western nations are measure it clearly. China doesn't like to admit to what they have, Russia doesn't count, and Africa has, we have no idea. But what we can ascertain is that from the economist, again, just to reiterate, it's about 30 million. So a lot of questions around Omicron, and this is important, and I, this, is the only, this is the point I'd like to make, Mr. Mayor, is that really the, what we're seeing now is an overwhelming drive in infection across the world. It's about 20% increase over the last year. And the best evidence we have as to what happens with vaccination and Omicron is actually what is essentially turning into a giant laboratory, which is Israel, where you have 500,000 people who've had the next fourth vaccination. Israeli children who were vaccinated against this are catching Omicron but they're doing it at less than half the rate of the unvaccinated peers, and there's nearly no illnesses with those who are unvaccinated. Oh, vaccinated, sorry. So at this stage, only out of 260,000 people in Israel who are active, only 289 actually have serious illness. And those are people, uh, it's a remarkable situation. In South Africa, there are 82% of hospitalizations during the Omicron fourth wave were unvaccinated. Again, talking about the, the ability of vaccines to mediate against the, the disorder. So on balance, what we're seeing now is a sense which is saying that Omicron is less serious. I would like to say it's a little premature. Uh, we're at this stage, you know, with the West really many parts of the West not vaccinated, the South and the Great Plains, there's a huge increase. Many hospitals are full, just a tremendous wait as the wave hits them. 
And in Florida, while cases are falling overall, deaths are still rising, and nearly all of them from unvaccinated patients. So what, what are the predictions that we can make from this? Well, I urge you to look at three stats, and those stats will help us predict. Nobody can say exactly what's going on. Stat number one is we need to see a radical and sustained fall in hospitalization and deaths. That statistic we'll see over the next week, and then we can be a little bit more comfortable. Second, we don't want to, we want to be sure that no new variants emerge. Now, as you know, mutations are constantly produced, but only a tiny number of these are actually of the, of the COVID virus. They occur overwhelmingly in patients who are immunocompromised in Africa, particularly in parts of Asia, and anybody who has a disease where their, their immune system is depressed, they can get multiple infections and it allows the virus to mutate. Right now, there are a lot of different variants. There are seven, as of January 7th, who are being monitored. But if nothing emerges which is as severe or worse than what we see in, in Omicron, then again, we can start to, that's a second data point which will say we're watching the tail end of the pandemic, which is all very encouraging. Then I think the third item is that we must see no diminution of vaccination. It's my firm belief that the United States government will instigate fourth vaccinations or will roll those out. Absolutely firmly believe that. They'll follow what was done in Israel. And in addition to which, I think you should feel very encouraged. I know factually that we're seeing in Pfizer and Moderna attempts to produce vaccines that are annual vaccines, not these, as I said to you, these early versions of the vaccines are like a Model T Ford, which is doing consuming gas and not going very great mileage. The next generation of vaccines will be much more effective in terms of length of period of time that they can protect. So on balance, I'm watching for those three uh, elements, and I feel that we're seeing, you know, there's reason to hope that there, we are seeing, at least in the United States, a, a tailing off on this, but vigilance cannot be stopped. So I'll stop and take any questions if the council wishes. Any questions wishes. for Dr. Levin? Chris? Yeah, just one Dr. Levin. Um, I thought I read a report that, uh, that showed doing a fourth booster in Israel did not significantly raise antibodies, and it was thought maybe not effective. 128 patients that came from an initial study in uh, in uh, Chaim Sheba Hospital, and that showed, in fact, just to give everybody facts on this, that these people were not raising the antibodies. A bigger study now has shown that you you are getting a five-fold increase in, in antibodies in a broader study. So I think that was preliminary. I think we'll have really definitive results. But a, the other side to that, Chris, is that there is no question that those who are hospitalized uh, are unvaccinated or have only had two and have not taken the third or fourth. Okay, thank you. Out of the unvaccinated or hospitalized, what percentage of those had previous infections? I don't have that in my head, but previous infection plus vaccination. No, no, you know, I, that, that wasn't the question. It, it just, it's strange to me that none of the data talks about that. It only talks no, no, about unvaccinated. They, it does talk about it, Chris, uh, Mike. I just don't have it in my oh, head. Okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I just, it I'm, I'm really, I, I am curious because, you know, it seems like past pandemics and all the other stuff and every, every disease known to man is like natural, natural immunity from it has always been something that's key. And it just doesn't seem to want to be talked about in this pandemic. No, it's no, it's not. It, it, it truly is not wanting to be. I don't have the figures, and I'm happy to provide them for you. Okay. The, the data is very clear on something else, which is if you, are, if you are ill and are then vaccinated, your chance of illness later are very much less. Mm -hmm. But I will I'll happily provide that to you. Okay. research or anything coming out, new facts, new um, information about um, unvaccinated children and the link with diabetes? Yes, that's actually, as I mentioned last week, that is of concern. Mm -hmm. the, uh, that is the long COVID, one of the long consequences of long COVID. That data appears to be solidifying. Mm -hmm. That in fact, 
the kids who do get this, there is a, it's about a threefold increase at this stage of diabetes, mm. which is still small, but it's nevertheless, it's worrying. So one needs to keep an eye on that and understand what exactly is. That is probably caused by a direct attack on the, uh, on the beta cells of the pancreas, which causes, which is the one that controls uh, how much insulin you produce. Thank you. But that, that'll all play out now. And it's, I would also add that that's not the only side effect that's being seen now. Some of these are longer term uh, neurological effects being seen which are also in kids. So that data is also playing out. Okay. Any other questions for Dr. Levin? Thank you, Dr. Thank, Thank, Thank you so you. much for your info. Uh, item seven would be Lisa Morrissey, but she's not here. Do you have an update you wanna? I can do that in the mayor's comments. Okay, uh, let's move to item eight. This is uh, a motion to elect three delegates for the Housatonic Health District. As you know, our size of our town, it goes by town, we're allowed three. These are three-year terms. The following people, Michael Crespin, Jeremy Levin, and Chris Cosgrove. The term being February 1st, 2022 through January 31st, 2025. Do I have a second? Okay. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh, I was going to discuss it, but that's okay. Um, okay. I know we discussed joining the health district I will say I've already heard from business owners in the community they are hugely concerned about the ability to get permits processed perhaps we jumped a little too quick on this but the horse is already out of the barn so Joe that was one of the things that I we talked about at the last meeting but I made absolutely crystal clear to the district that we will be monitoring it and the one of the benefits for the district is we will move from one sanitarian, if we're looking at environmental sciences, mm -hmm. to the possibility of five. So, so the, the whole, five spread over so the whole, time. the whole key is to have, and I expressed it to Lisa, who will be the director, who is our director here, that we will have as good or better service. Mm -hmm. well, let's hope we can sell that to the business community. Is that but if, it, if it isn't better? If it degrades, um, is it? And we, we have stuck in this thing we, for, I don't, no, we no. have the ability to opt out if okay. we want. You asked that question two weeks yep. ago. <laughs> but I'm I'm with you, Councilman. It's all about providing that level of service. Anything. Anything. Chris? And to address your point, Joe, um, <clears throat> one of my big focuses will be making sure there are KPIs, metrics in place to measure service mm -hmm. and that we are in fact delivering as good if not better. Uh, I, I'm astounded how quickly I've, I've gotten some feedback on this. Yeah, no, uh, I've heard. Before it's even put together. Yeah, um, there's a lot of concern. Well, I think and, part I, and of, I share that. Well, I think been, part of concern is the health department. Low. It's been bad service. I don't want to say bad. It's been not up to par service for a while because we only had the one sanitarian. Well, then COVID, COVID has taken yes, over the right. health department. But having, having more people, even though, like you just said, you know, there's more area to cover. Uh, that you know, we we are the larger town, so okay. we don't try it. I don't know. Okay, so we have a, a vote. The next, sorry, we voted before you spoke, Joe. Did you? Oh, did you? Yep. No. All in favor? Yep. Aye. All in favor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? Thank you. Mayor, comments? Thank you. Uh, I'll keep them as brief as I possibly can. Uh, since Lisa's here, I'll, I'll talk again about the COVID numbers. These are in totality. Since almost two years ago, March, that's how the state tracks them. So the state of Connecticut is at 614,470. Litchfield County is at 25,237, which is up 378 from Friday. Hospitalizations for the entire county of Litchfield is at 34, which was down six from Friday. If you read any of the news media, you see that hospitalizations did trend down this past week, according to Governor Lamont. New Milford is at 4,565, which is up 58 from Friday. Our vaccine statistics from January 20th, 2022, and this is a seven to 10 day look back on top of that date. For first doses, we're at 22,038, which equals 82.22%. 
of New Milford and fully vaccinated is at 20,650, which is 74.04%. Uh, the New Milford COVID vaccine clinics are every Wednesday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. at Pettibone. These clinics uh, currently for January, well, this is the last one, have been booked and I know that Lisa and the district are working on providing uh, additional dates in February and I'll have those updates uh, as soon as I receive them. You can still get COVID vaccines at Big Y, Walgreens, CVS, Walmart's offering the vaccine as well. Please check their websites for availability. COVID testing we're still doing here in New Milford and that's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Friday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. This is the PCR test and currently they're at about 72 hours to get your results. Also, recommendations as we say each and every time for COVID-19 protocols is get your vaccine and your booster shot if you're eligible. You also have the opportunity if you have not gotten a vaccine to do so. If you're experiencing any COVID-19 system uh, symptoms, please stay home if you're not feeling well. If your child's not feeling well, please do not send them to school order any any after school activity please continue with the hand hygiene protocols if you're in high dense populated areas inside please wear a mask and also uh, we pushed this out on our social sites before the federal government is offering up to four free home covid test kits you can pick those up at double slash special dot usps dot com slash test kits I'll push that out again on our sites as well. And that gives you the availability through the United States Post Office to get four free home test kits. Now, if you have a, well, I've had a few people ask, you have a similar address, same address, and there's mm -hmm. two families in there. I'll provide a link that I just got before uh, I came here tonight where you can actually call a number and you can work with them to get your test kits that, wa that way as well. As far as infrastructure, uh, roads update. First one is in speaking with uh, Connecticut DOT, and Jack has done this as well. The state will be relamping various streetlights in various towns in Connecticut, and Milford is one of them. They will be replacing the current LCD lamps that have a life expectancy of eight years with new ones that have a life expectancy of 15 years. The roads will be fitted with the new LED lights in New Milford are Route 7 Pickett District, Route 7 Sunny Valley, Route 109 in Chestnut Land, Railroad Street and Bridge Street, Railroad Street and Grove Street, uh, Route 7 in Sullivan Road, Route 7 in Pegler Road, Route 7 by the Home Depot Car Wash, Route 7 Still River Drive, and Route 7 Dodge Road. I'll provide additional updates once we get the timeline for the replacement and once it begins. Library construction, uh, and speaking with our contractor and library boards of trustees, uh, well, due to supply chain disruptions that have been sweeping the country. Unfortunately, it's had a serious effect on the timing of the building project. Despite the fact the crews have been working hard each and every day, much progress has been made, but the originally completed plan that we thought would be this, the end of this month is not going to be, is not gonna happen, it's not gonna be achieved. Instead, the anticip anticipated project completion will now be in June. As we approach the date, we will be sharing official information with you regarding our opening date and the events as the project prog progresses. Uh, I've kept up with the Library Board of Trustees, uh, as well as um, Katie and I have been talking to the contractor each and every week. And due to the fact of these supply chain shortages and COVID, which has affected a lot of our subcontractors, this will be the new date. Congratulations to our New Milford Youth Cricket club teams u13 and 17 they've been accepted to the national youth cricket league for 2022 this will allow the players and club to be exposed and watched by national selectors and the ability for the club to host games and tournaments in new milford which is truly amazing all these games will be live streamed on the national cricket network we're very excited uh that this is becoming, first of all, as far as a world sport, it's the fastest growing sport in the world. And to have New Milford become a part of that on a national level is truly amazing. So I want to thank the Cricket Club. I want to thank our Park and Rec team as they actually field at Clatter Valley 
And if you get a chance to see a cricket game, it's pretty cool. Want to congratulate New Milford High School girls cross country coach Giles Vaughn for he got the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Coaches, which is the USTFCCCA Annual High School Coach of the Year for girls in the state of Connecticut. Wow. So outstanding job, Giles. And also to the ladies who, who we honor here with their amazing thing. I want to congratulate the New Milford High School wrestling team for winning the New Milford tournament this past weekend. Excellent work uh, by Max Peel and Evan Linder for they won their weight classes. So again, wrestling team does a phenomenal job each and every year. Great Town Hall Roof, the work is progressing here. We're actually uh, ahead, of t ahead of schedule. So beginning tomorrow, the parking lanes that are right here, spots that are here on Church Street on the town side will be closed. Park and Rec's gonna put some Jersey barriers there as we put the scaffolding on this side of the building as we're going. So the sidewalk on this side will be closed. Um, scaffolding will be up and the parking spaces. You still can get into the uh, parking, the, into the town hall through Church Street or through the front door as well. And we'll be providing more updates as we get uh, farther along in the process. But we're excited they're, they're there ahead of time. Mm. The New Milford High School roof, due to the snow and the ice that we've had this past week, they've had limited uh, work on the roof. Uh, but once the weather breaks a little more, they'll be back up there and continuing on the roof. On budgets, uh, currently the Board of Education this week is finalizing uh, their budget. I believe Thursday is their day of when they deliberate for their budget and how the process works once they're completed, right, Joe? Then it comes over to the town side. Uh, on the town side, we're, we're still working with our department heads, uh, coming up with a finalization on the town side, working on the five-year capital plan, both the town and the Board of Ed to look at doing it symbiotically in a partnership and we're working uh with them and we'll have more information uh, as we move forward on the budget process uh, as far as some of the other projects that we have going on as well um, we have the uh, energy uh, program that we're working in tandem with the board of education and that program right jack seems to be going uh going on time and that project, as we're all aware, because we voted on it, is a $14 million project, uh, both on the town side, Board of Ed side together. We're going to use the energy savings to buy all that capital. So we'll provide continual updates as we continue to go through the process. Our, uh, speaking with our building inspector, Bill Murphy, uh, we continue to see strong application process in our permit uh, use. This past week, they did 35 new applications. 73 inspections were done and 48 COs were uh, issued. So we're still, and that's in January. So that's very uh, good news on behalf of the town as we continue to see uh, strong growth in that sector as well. Jack mentioned before for those that were here for our town meeting concerning the Tamarack and the Chunersky Bridge. Uh, mud, mud, mud Pond Road Bridge, we're still waiting for the bridge rail, correct, Jack, is that's on back order? Uh, again, a supply chain issue. Uh, we're trying to find out maybe there's another way that we could do open it without those rails, maybe put some Jersey barriers on there. Jack will be uh, letting us know about that throughout the week. Um, our Lanesville Fire Department needed a new oil tank that was installed, so that's done. So thank you to our facilities team and the contractor. Uh, also uh, wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Century Brass as we continue with the remediation work there. We did have all the steel that was taken up. Uh, also, we are kind of ahead of schedule in, remo in removing some of the uh, uh, material that was still on that site, correct, Jack, for that. So we're kind of ahead working on that. Uh, also, Jack and his team are working on the reservoir dam uh, project. So we'll be filling uh, the council in in February on that project with the American Relief Funds. We're able to do that full uh, $1.2 million renovation. So thank you uh, for that as well. And uh, uh, as far as the roads themselves, Jack and his team right now, uh, this is the time where they complete their engineering plans. We're putting out the bids and specs, which will be a couple weeks, right, Jack? Yep. It, it, uh, they're out to bid right 
out. Uh, we expect to be back in mid February and we'll be able to issue uh, a recommendation for a contractor. Or by the beginning of March. And lastly, I just cannot thank uh, our town employees, our board, of our board of Education employees, as we continue to go through this pandemic. Uh, without them, we couldn't do the work. And I cannot thank our volunteers. Some of them are here sitting in this room here on our boards and commissions to continue to have our government run. Um, very special town, very thankful to everyone. Thank you, Katie. That's the best town in the USA. Amen, right? it is. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to item 10. Uh, we have an update uh, virtual presentation from Dale Proof. Dale will be on the TV right there. Can we see it? Oh, that kind of virtual presentation. Yep. <laughs> We got you, Dale. So thank you for having me remote. Um, just recovering from COVID myself, as a matter of fact, but I'm good. Um, so uh, I wanted to just give an update to the council on the product I've been working on. I came before you a couple months ago, three months ago, to talk in generalities about uh, doing a cluster, business cluster plan in the area of health sciences for the town, all with the idea that ultimately the plan would engage the health sciences sector, business sector in the town and in the region to increase the tax base in town and to also increase the employment base in town. So uh, I sort of have a multi-part uh, scope of work. The, fir the first part was to do a data-driven kind of overview of where you are in the marketplace, that how it affects uh, the healthcare cluster. And as I define health sciences, it includes healthcare, STEM, biotech, and all the supply chain related businesses that are affected. So my first task is to do the uh, overview. Uh, there's a nine page report, which mayor, uh, the mayor has in his office that he can share with you. I won't go through all the nine pages of it, obviously. Um, but basically I took a look at the most important issues facing the town and the opportunities that would create an environment for business growth in this area. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about the later tasks in a minute, but basically I took a look at the demographics, uh, which does drive the strategy. Um, I looked at your population, I uh, looked at your population decline and your, including your school system, which also creates an opportunity uh, for bringing in more tax paying residents in these sectors. I took a look at your housing prices. Uh, the, you know, the median family sales price of a house in New Milford is 301,000 in 2021, and you would need an income of uh, about 75,000 a year but the median household income in New Milford is, according to the uh, data, 62,000. So we need to create more jobs in the health sector areas. Um, I took a look at the educational attainment of residents, which is on the higher end of the region. The one that's really stuck out for me when I looked at the data about the town was the commuting data of town residents. Almost 80% of the residents of New Milford work somewhere else than New Milford. And that to me really stuck out uh, as a good motivator to bring more business into town. Uh, and because, and that's not uncommon in residential and uh, suburban communities. You're, you're sort of a hybrid of 28,000 people roughly, but 80% of your people do not work in New Milford, which affects of course, your real retail restaurants and everything else. I took a look at the town position uh, in terms of its financial position. And that is a great opportunity. You have a low mill rate, you have a strong bond rating, um, and you have 13, a little over 13% of your grand list is, uh, is commercial. So there's a lot of room to grow that. Uh, so basically I took things that could be perceived as challenges and made them into opportunities. Again, this is all in the report. Um, I did a, a quick analysis of the, the most, the largest commercial properties in Milford, about 10 or 12 of them, that's in the report. And then I took a good look at the job market in these areas of health sciences. I won't go through every single one, but suffice to say, um, it, well, one of the things I found that was in biotech, there's not a lot of companies in, even in the region um, 
uh, in, in, not in the Milford, but there's a lot of healthcare and STEM related businesses. So that's again in the report. Um, I looked at jobs that are going to grow over the next 10 years between 2018 and 2028. And the top uh, healthcare jobs that are going to be growing in New Milford itself are going to be occupational therapy, physical therapy, and those are all generating uh, salaries that, uh, you know, that are in $70,000 range. Um, in biotech, you know, the biotech numbers are skewed because uh, they all end in 2018. They haven't updated, but suffice to say that even not even considering COVID, the biotech growth in Connecticut is enormous. Um, in the distribution area of biotech, and that includes now PPE and testing, um, you know, mergers and acquisitions. It's up like 21 percent, and that's before that's before 2019. Medical devices up, R and D up. So this is all in the report. Um, I examine in the report all the workforce development opportunities that you have in your town. You have a lot of great programs in your board of education. I've been on the phone with your board of education uh, in the healthcare careers and in STEM careers. Um, I've talked to, of course, your regional workforce board that has a lot of programs. Uh, so there's a lot of partnerships that, that can happen. And, and of course, you have your colleges and universities, Naugatuck uh, and um, you know, Western Connecticut. I looked at the supply chain, the impact of health sciences on many, many, many different businesses from uh, construction to marketing, sales, dining, uh, content creation and marketing, safety, security, you know, it goes on and on. And so, so as health sciences grow in New Milford, so will these uh, supply chain areas. Of course, your largest employers are in the region. If I looked at the top uh, 10 employers in the town, four of them are health sciences. So to just summarize, I'm trying to keep this to a, a you know, reasonable uh, presentation. Uh, you have a lot of good uh, factors for growing the healthcare sector. The next phases of what I'm going to do beyond just doing a study is to engage the employers in town. I've talked to Mayor Bass about this, uh, either Zoom and live, or probably a combination given what we've been through lately. Uh, engage the Board of Education with the business community. Engage the business community with each other. And that's what a cluster is, to find common needs. And I think a lot of them are workforce related, uh, but also to find a way to bring them more into New Mills. So that's a quick overview of what I've been working on. Uh, the next phase of this will be a very active phase where we will have a lot of public meetings with your employers uh, and, and we will try to include the Board of Education in the, in the process because they're really critical because they're the pipeline to the new trained employees. So Mayor Pete, that's what I had for the overview for tonight. I don't know if there's any questions for now, but I will create a one page summary of the nine pages, just bullet points. Uh, for council members if they if they don't get the whole thing, but we'll put that out through the mayor's office so anybody in the town can read it. And now with your permission, um, I will send the, the draft that you had sent me to the council um, so that they yes. can have it. And if you could send the one page draft to the council at newmilford.org as well as to me so that all the council members can get that as well. Does anybody Absolutely. have any questions currently for Dale as he's going through this process? Joe? Have you worked with New Milford Board of Education on programs in the health sciences? Because I know they had to drop their EMT class. I do not know offhand if they have a CNA class or an LPN class. And I know those are all areas right here in New Milford where there's tremendous shortage at this exact time. Well, you're, you're right about the shortage. Uh, I have been talking to them. They just got a big grant from the Perkins Foundation uh, to develop some new career path programs in these areas. Uh, and I've been uh, talking to, not the superintendent, but the woman who's in charge of career services. Uh, so I think they're starting up new programs through a big grant that they just got. Uh, but all over the state, I know from doing work around the state and in where I live in the New Haven area, Hampton area, uh, boards of education are really on board. But that you have to integrate the business community in the process not just the Board of Ed, so that there's a connection between the parents and the students and the, you know, in the marketplace. So uh, I'm getting familiar with your Board of Ed, but they are doing a lot of work with this big grant from the Perkins Foundation. So there'll be a lot more information on this coming up. 
So, so I, have a, I have a quick question. Um, I haven't seen the report yet, but one of the things that I want to know is, so biotech is a very hot topic nowadays, right? It's probably not going to be only New Milford fighting for the same talent. Yes. So I guess the question would be, in the future, how are we going to attract the people that will come to New Milford with the skills in biotech, which is very broad, but sales could be anywhere from 50000 to probably 150000 to $200,000. It depends what they do in the biotech. Let's say, I don't know, I'm just guessing. but. What I would like to well, see in the future, and hopefully uh, you can provide it at some point, is basically the plan. How are we going to get those people that are engaged in the biotech right now, they'll come here, maybe some executives, or, uh, and how are we going to get um, those jobs actually um, in the new world for itself? Because those are very, very well paid jobs, and they're not going to go away for the next 50 years, probably past that. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think that uh, there's any doubt that, given even with COVID and you know everything else that's going on, that the biotech market is going to slow down at all. One thing I think that you have to think about, and this happens where I live in the New Haven region, you know, you have Yale and the New Haven's a big biotech area because of the university. You have to think regionally a little bit uh, and think about how you could benefit from larger employers that are involved in biotech. Uh, you have only a couple in your whole region. Uh, so you have to think in terms of the town benefits for, let's say, tool manufacturing in, for biotech, medical device manufacturing versus the actual research. So there's ways to work on this in a cluster, uh, not just with the biotech companies, because they're very up and down. That's the other thing in the marketplace, stock prices and so forth. But um, I think you have to really work uh, in a long range plan with your board of ed to bring the kids up to think about biotech as a career uh, and start at a younger age. And I think that it's a longer uh, strategy, but that's the way to do it. You have good housing here. You have good, uh, uh, in terms of financials, good, a good way, a good uh, environment for investment. And that's a positive thing. So that's something to work on. 10 years from now, what are you talking about? What about five years from now? Or well, two years well, from now? <laughs> Well, you have to think that far ahead. Absolutely, I agree with that. You have to think that far ahead, but I do think you have to think regionally as well. Any other questions for Dale? Thank you, Dale. And we'll Welcome look forward to your night, next everybody. update. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Mel. That Absolutely. Really worked really well. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Okay, uh, item 11, uh, we removed earlier. Item 12 would be... Uh, the purchasing authority and i'd like to make a motion for approval of the revised purchasing regulations which i believe valerie yeah, we have valerie here. douglas our purchasing authority okay. tell us about agent is there a second second, second. thank, thank you, you joe you, thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you joe i didn't mean to i'm sorry no, no, you didn't good. catch my sarcasm did anybody have any questions for valerie what was valerie Me. Um, what we started out with was a document that was now, really you quite old. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. uh, we started with a document that was really quite old and very outdated. Um, I spoke before you last April on our sustainable purchasing uh, initiative, and at that time it was uh, brought up by the council to update the. Uh, basically our limits. We had very low limits as to what triggers a uh, something going out to bid. Of course, everything goes up. <laughs> Things that were very nominal, very simple, now become much more involved than they really don't need to be. Um, other items that were updated were um, language, including our new e-purchasing system as to how we notify people. Um, so, let's see. Um, updating who is uh, controlling documents and uh, the release of such. The purchasing authority itself uh, really doesn't oversee the documents. That's something that I do. And if I have any issues, I go to them. Uh, so that's really, a, that's a lot of what it is. It's just really updating for what we do today in purchasing versus what we did 
way back then in purchasing. And Randy, you had a chance to take a look at the revisions and they meet your approval? And made a certain revision, but it's fine. Thank you. And it's lawful. I just like to comment. Katie? Uh, Valerie? Yes. Um, I just have to say, you, you do a wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, you do a lot of stuff, but you're great. You don't, you're right on top of it. Now, I will say, I know that Jack had said that some things were out to bid. We currently have uh, 10 items out for bid right at the moment, and I have two more that came in today, so we will be putting those out uh, this week. So there are 12 items. That's a, That's lot, a lot of things out That's for bid lot. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am very thankful for the e-procurement system to really be able to make that manageable. I bet. Thanks. But thank you. Any other any other questions for Valerie? We have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. so, All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you Perfect. again, Valerie. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Item 13, uh, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, this is for the ARPA funds. I'd like to move that the following distribution of funds be approved. Chernisky Bridge, 600000 Harry Brook Bridge, 126000 Hey, Katie. On, <laughs> you these, them? Uh, on these ones here, Harry Brook, the New Milford Sewer and the New Milford Police Department. These are all ones that we talk about first, and then oh, if okay. it's agreeable, we bring them back oh, you at don't the want next to do meeting. The bridge? Okay. The oh, Chinerski Bridge, I believe we talked about it before. Yes, we did. But so. if the council wants to continue to talk about that, we can. But I know these other ones, this is the first time. Oh, and the medical kits. Right. This is the first time we talked about it as the council. So we right. could, if it's Didn't agreeable. Didn't we discuss we Harry Brook before or no? We did not. Okay. No. So no. do you want to discuss, you want to take the two that we've already discussed out and do those first? The only one that we've discussed so far was the Chinerski Bridge project. And that's the, the PD, because that's an adjustment. Nope. No? The PD one is just is a brand new, uh, is a brand new oh, request. Oh, okay. So the then uh, the motion is for the Chinerski Bridge project, $600,000. I would argue that, that there's been new information tonight, so we need okay. to... We, then I'll retake my motion off yeah. the table. <laughs> there was a request for um, an estimate for a free flow bridge, so we, we need to see that. Before we, before you want to allocate the ARPA funds? Yeah, I would think so. Okay. What's that? The council uh, agree that? Wait till Jack bring it back to the next meeting. Jack, can you have an estimate for us to the next meeting? Yes. For the the other uh, way to get it to get for, the bridge with the water. That'd be the port forward. in place. Yeah. Okay. So. I have a question on that one. Is it possible to have like pros and cons? And whatever. Absolutely. Would that be fine? Okay, cool. And the cons are bad. Okay, so that'll we'll move that to the next meeting. Yes. Uh, the Harry Brook Bridge. Did we want to talk yep. about so that? So Harry Brook. Um, I'm trying to grab. Uh, hang on one second here. I had Billy Buckley's. Uh, he's our state representative, oh, the also the director at Harry Brook Park. Yeah, you want the letter. So he had uh, emailed me Fair that enough. the. There you go. Thank you. But the bridge itself, and I had sent uh, to the council as well, the bridge itself that when you exit Harrybrook Park uh, is in very bad disrepair. The cost to do that uh, would be uh, almost $6 million. Uh, Bill went ahead and had been talking with uh, their um, consulting engineer, WMC, and there's a way to make some repairs that would give the life of the bridge to be able to still use it. About three years if they do do this um, technique, the cost would be about $126,000. And the goal would be to do this three year repair, so to speak, that would allow uh, Harrybrook Park to go and get grants, uh, both state and federal funding, to actually get this bridge done. As we all know, this bridge, uh, uh, we all know Harrybrook Park not only serves New Milford, but it serves the entire regional community. I think this would be a great investment, especially when we're talking about COVID funds, is when we were knee deep in COVID and we had shut down uh, a lot of our businesses. Really, the only place you could go is outside to our parks, Harrybrook Park being one of them, That's where right. people could go outside uh, in a COVID compliant way at the time, walk, uh, enjoy the park so my recommendation would be for us to use those uh, American relief funds uh, so that they could get this bridge fixed for a three-year time to allow them to still continue on and find those other funding sources okay. so I'd like to move that we uh, do it 
We have no motion on the floor. No, it's just for discussion. Okay. Usually we move and then we discuss. Ah. So, if oh, you'd like. Are looking for an approval tonight? Is that what you're saying? That's I thought what we were this. Just discussing tonight. This is for possible action on the following on distribution. We can we can just That's, bring it back the next one, Katie, if you if, want. If yeah. We can bring them all back then. Yeah. Sure. Chris, I'm just going by my agenda. Yep. So, um, question: Would this be over? Would this project be overseen by somebody at DPW, or is Harry Burke? You mean the hundred and twenty-six thousand? Yes. It would go to uh, Jack. You're shaking your head. Is it this? Yep. What's that? Just Go ahead, Jack. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dungeon C is a contractor that we use for a lot of our inspections. Yeah. And we were uh, meeting out of Harrisville Park for another reason, but they are, they've already been talking to us about the issue of the bridge. Okay, so, but if typically if they're doing work for you, you do you have somebody who kind of project manage them, or how does that work? You know, like, uh, Dan, Dan and Dan McKee and myself, we're, the two, we're pretty much the bridge people. Okay, so and this one we're going to be depending on Harry Brook to kind of manage the contract it's himself. Pro, it's their, it's their right. No, I, I get it. Okay. I mean, they could ask Jack for his opinion if he wanted to, but right? Yeah, and then uh, on the financial side, uh, what sort of tie does there need to be back to our finance department because this is a private park? So these well, what, funds are well, what happens if approved by council and board of finance and the town a town meeting. Because unlike what some people said at public participation, there is a process right. that we go through that we do go through, and we did do surveys, by the way. We talked about right. it, yep. but that's yep. neither here nor there. But um, well, what would happen is we would cut the amount, the 126, right. right, right, give it to Harry Brook, and then they would then use those, use that for the work. Okay, all right, Hillary. So this is a private fund, right? We don't we have, we don't have any ownership of Harry Brook. There's it's a foundation or fourteen Correct. million dollar foundation, I think. So what inhibits them from coming up with a solution? What why is why are we? It's just a request that was that came before you. Like there's no town other than that we use it, but they have a they have a fund. Um, They're to, not a nonprofit, to, right? They are a nonprofit. They are a nonprofit. They're a nonprofit. Yeah. They could go ask for nonprofit um, help. So and the, also, my other question. Oh, sorry. I was going to say the reason uh, they were, I was approached by numerous residents mm -hmm. um, and by the executive director was the immediacy of this. If this doesn't happen, they're shutting down that bridge. So you won't have uh, an exit to get in there or to get out of there. I don't know how that would work as far as through with our fire marshal, through uh, our safety, if you'd have people in that small road that you go into, being able to get out, how would all that work? So it was the immediacy is why I brought it to the attention to the council. Okay. Where this had the availability for us, if we so chose to use these funds, to give them that three year bridge of which they could go find all that additional funding. So. Um, what happens if they don't secure sufficient funding to fix the bridge? They would then finish it with their own funds? They'd have to, exactly, they'd have to figure out how to, how to take care of that. I mean, it's currently shut down now, right? No, uh, the bridges, but the whole park is because it's winter. No, you can well, no. the road, but you can walk. No, you yes, can walk. Yeah. You've got to walk, you've got to use park the parking lot outside. outside. Right. And, yes. well, and that and that could present a challenge for those people that are in wheelchairs. Oh, yeah. sure. Those but people I, that have a hard time walking, especially. Um, but, I, but my question was, yeah. what would happen if they don't secure enough funding to complete the project? And they said this buys maybe three years. That's someone's estimation who's in the business. Let's say that's a good estimation. What if they don't secure, how many million did you say it was six million? Looks like five point something. Yeah, I saw that. Okay. Full, full so blown out repair. Then we, we've expended the money. They may have some grants, but not enough. Would the, the opportunity for them to come back to the town? I mean, obviously it's, it's used by everybody in the town, even though it belongs to them. But I, I guess I'd have to ask the question that, that you asked, Hillary, is um, why wouldn't they use 126,000 of their own funding from their foundation. We can ask them that. I mean, I don't, I've not seen their 990. I don't know what their profitability I, is. I haven't either, but we can ask them that. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I, I, only reason I'm asking is because we have other areas in town that might, you know, this could set a precedent that we might not, not that I have anything against Harry Brook, it's beautiful. I'm just looking at it from the council's point of view that, uh, and ARPA point of view. I'd like to know so we can find that out. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we could have possibly Mr. Buckby and maybe a member of their board or two to come and talk and answer questions. Billy was going to come tonight, but he, like a bunch of other people currently, are with COVID. Yep. So, so are also, we can ask him maybe, to come to the next maybe, meeting, absolutely. But not just the executive director, but maybe also a board member, because we, I think absolutely. if we knew a little history about what they did with the bridge and... I know there's reference to a letter that five years ago with concerns about the bridge. This is an ongoing thing. I Absolutely. think we need to hear more. They had a letter, or who had a letter? Uh, it's in. It's oh, it's in, in the, this W. Yeah, it's in, oh, it's in oh, the gotcha. material. I read it. <laughs> okay. Um, that there was reference to oh. a previous inspection. There you go. So they weren't surprised. So I want to know what planning they had been doing over the time. Good I'd point. also like to know um, what's the procedure for anything that they do there. Um, and has the town paid for things for Harry Brook before? No. Okay. Well, well no, let, me, let me say that. <laughs> I, I'm not aware. Something could have happened 40 years ago that I'm no, not aware of. But right. okay. as far as that, I'm yeah. aware. There have been ups and downs in Harry Brook. Well, you know. Got it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, what? it's a great park. Yeah. And, Absolutely. And, but I think they have resources and we have questions. Absolutely. I just want to get everything straight in my head as far as the dollars. So the hundred and twenty six thousand will do what? Hundred and twenty six thousand right according to the yeah. thing that you got from WMC. Give them yeah, allows that's, it to that's allows a three year it, temporary repair. Right. Allows them to do the temporary repair that, that they were saying WMC the engineers, I'm not one, will give them like an additional three years time on that bridge, a time life. And then which would allow the park to then go after grants. Uh, go after fundraising. No, no I got. I'm good. I'm just trying. So then, what's the 1.9 million number? That'd be for a different. Uh, it's uh, an alternative, a rehabilitation yep. alternative. All right. So it's so it's it's band aid for 126, rehabilitate for 1.94 million, or replace at six million. Is that? Yep. Am I correct? I just want to get those two minutes. Right. Now, as far as it being a nonprofit, we have a. There is a process for nonprofits, which is the other part we of the We have a process. We yeah. have already allocated ARPA funds oh, yeah. for nonprofits. We haven't done the RFPs yet, but. Yeah, so, um, I mean, that. But that those is are really, like but that. that's not enough right. money. Yeah, there's like the, the five thousand dollar grant. Yeah, it's, it would be more than they're asking for. Is there also, this is my last point on this, but is there any legal component for the from him being a legislator and an executive director? So he gets the funds for ARPA, but designates it to? No? Not that I'm Nothing. aware of. Okay. Well, he wouldn't be the one to get it. It would be the. The part, foundation. You know, exactly. The foundation. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah, we wouldn't. Uh, Okay. So, so we'll get an answer. And so I will get. Time. I will bring back to the council at the next meeting. See if uh, uh, Representative Buckley and a board member can come. We'll also ask for their 990s financials, and then uh, an update on, like you were asking, uh, Katie, is if you can't get the funds, what, what happens? happens? Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. I mean, I just wondered. Does have a plan A, B, and maybe Absolutely. C? Absolutely. Oh, thanks. All right. So the sewer commission. Uh, they need a compact and portable mainline crawler camera. It's thirty-eight thousand. Like a good thing to me. And what that does is it allows them to go into the actual sewer um, pipes. And there's a lot of times due to growth, you have root systems in there that can bog down the pipes, uh, that can cause backups, that can cause issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so this pipe, this uh, camera would be very handy in helping them uh, locate where those. Uh, uh, obstacles could be within the sewer system. Mary? Yep. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to prolong these mind numbingly long council meetings here because we're never getting out of here tonight. But how much money are we spending on vendors to use their camera systems as opposed to buying it ourselves? And what do we do when it breaks Jack, or needs to? Jack's not Jack the WPCA, but I can tell you, being on the commission, it's a lot of money that we pay uh, by not having that camera ourselves. It pays for itself. Well, we rented or used somebody else's camera to look at a small line in front of the library to make sure that it wasn't a, in, impacted by some roots. That was kind of pricey, I thought. 
but I didn't know the well, price of the camera. There's private companies that do this for a living. Yeah. And who are we going to qualify or who's going to be qualified within our place to run these cameras through the system? Do we have one now, an old one? The yeah. technicians can do it. Pete, do we have a camera? Yeah, they've run them, they've run them before. That's what I thought. Yeah. We've rented them and then they run them. So there's a no problem. Okay, so you Any want, is that other you, questions on this? You want one? to do that one as a separate item? This one we can bring back oh, to we're the next. Just talking week. about yep. it. Okay. Does anybody have something from the sewer? Show us. The sewer uh, commissioner, you know, the, the yeah, sewer sure. here next meeting. Or, uh, it's a camera on a on a track. Right. Yeah. Runs itself down the line. As Here's from John sending. Whitman. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. We finalized the selection of the compact portable mainline crawler camera to be used to identify problems as well as successful repairs in our sewer collection system. The purchase of this apparatus will not only afford us quick and accurate results, but also greatly reduce the number of times and significant expense that we've experienced by hiring vendors to do the work for us. The final cost plus shipping is $38,000. Thank you for your generosity and support of the Milford WPCA by offering to pursue funding for this device. Right, you well, I, we can see that. I, I just want somebody to explain to me. But then again, you know, we're using these ARPA funds for all kinds of stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like if it's pot of money, you gotta figure out how to spend it. Okay, so we're gonna have, uh, are we asking for more information? No, you can I run it up the flagpole right now, see if it'll fly. What information would you like that you don't wanna vote on it now? Well. There's reference to the fact that it's slightly more expensive than the five-year capital plan estimate. So wouldn't that, uh, wouldn't they already have some of the money in their budget for their five-year capital plan? No. They didn't plan for this. A five-year capital plan has money if this was out in year two, year three. They don't have that in their budget yet. They're planning for it. They're planning for the it. And then, you gotta, and then you also have to look at when you do the capital plan, we now have rates of inflation, hmm. as we've all seen with steel with everything else. So in this particular project, the more you wait, it's going to cost you more money. Well, we're only talking about another meeting, which is two weeks away, but I think that part of the problem is, so we've spent 90% um, uh, of the funds, pretty much, 85 to 90% of our funds. So I would like to see the remaining, um, you know, big issues, like we've been talking about addiction and depression. So we're, here, we're going to hear from Justin next week. Um, so then we can kind of decide on this last bunch when we kind of have the last remaining items before us, instead of picking, saying yes to this now and then not having enough to allocate to the stuff that yeah. really makes sense for our therapy. Okay. Yeah. All right, so uh, under the same sewer commission, uh, Mayor, we have sewer connection fee yep. abatement, 138,000. Yep. So this particular one is one of the main issues that we have uh, with the sewer is the actual connection fee. It's prohibited lots of people from hooking up mm -hmm. or people investing in the sewer district. The sewer uh, expansion was done with the benefit of uh, having our business community hook up to the sewer. Uh, and it also, without a sewer system, you have no downtown, you have no Route 7, you have no area uh, uh, to dispose of the waste. We had uh, lots of problems with nitrogen uh, that, that fed into the Housatonic River. Mm. So we did a plan expansion. That expansion is only right now at 30% capacity. It costs money to run this, this plant and it costs you even more to run it inefficiently. Yeah, it's inefficient when it's not up fire. Correct. Right? Yeah. So when looking at the actual connection fees that the sewer district pays to the town of Milford, because the town of Milford is the one that actually holds, as Greg will tell you, it holds the bond that we pay. We support the Sewer Commission and they, uh, uh, to the tune of between $1.5 and $1.7 million a year in bond payments. <coughs> Correct, Greg? Sure. Yep, it's around there. Now, the thing that Council needs to be made aware of is that these connection fees, right, uh, as we're going to talk about in just a moment or two, within the next couple of years, they're not going to be here anymore. Okay? Because the term that this plant was going to get done and the connection fees run out, payable to the town. 
Right now, currently, Greg, we get about four hundred and some thousand dollars in revenue, four fifty in revenue. So what do we do? What we need to do is get more plant capacity within the sewer plant. So what I uh, would propose that the town council do with one hundred and thirty-eight thousand dollars, and how I came up with that is you look at the connection fees from the highest year, which would be two thousand and twenty, which the supplemental connection fee, which is the connection fee to at, get into the district, is seventy-two thousand four hundred thirty thirty-five. Then we have thirty-four thousand two hundred thirteen dollars and fifteen cents for those that are on a payment plan. My suggestion is you do a two-year moratorium. You take the amount, which would be one hundred thirty-eight thousand. You take that as a moratorium to allow people to connect to the sewer for free doesn't hurt the sewer district because they have the capital funds that they have that they would have gotten in their best year, which is 2020. It allows then for people that can't afford some of the homes, some of the condo complexes that have tried to connect, but the cost is too prohibitive to connect, which brings some added health uh, to the district, also some safety, and also allows for uh, some more business expansion as well. Pete, is this so? These are, would be abatements for residential and commercial. For two years, we talk commercial. About commercial, 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 commercial. Oh, commercial. Okay. Yeah, just along that point, I'm I'm on the sewer line, and I'm not connecting. We have an old right. septic system that we keep using. It's not great, but we pump it and we keep going. Why don't you connect? Because I'm not paying the fee. Right. And so it it. I'm not sure why we're only doing it temporary. I don't understand why we'd want to charge people to pay us a fee on a regular basis. And we should get as many people hooked up, get that thing up to 60, 70 percent, and actually start revenue to revenue. So I'm, I mean, I'm all for it, whether it's ARPA funds or we do it in the budget. We need to, we need to get rid of the, uh, we need to get rid of the fee at least temporarily. To get the people that have been right. waiting to hook up so that we can start getting the revenue from them. And if we continue at such a low rate of using you know with its mechanics and all it's just it's worse for it to not have yeah and then we fill capacity. up with sludge from other towns which doesn't help and no we don't it, it so work. it's just no. it it needs to be done chris and, and i would just add i think that there are businesses who are currently on the sewer system who won't expand because mm -hmm. then there's an additional fee for them to expand absolutely and so right. getting rid of that it, to me I mean, the, the connection fees are just bizarre. And bringing businesses from other towns. Yes. And I can we and I can tell you firsthand that there are businesses that have a left in Milford, mm -hmm. and ones that have thought oh, about yes. moving here, that once they get into the the actual costs of being part of part of the business community, this is a driver where they're just like you know what they put their pencil down and um, they're moving on. No, yeah. It's the re the main reason when they get to figuring out the cost to come here. That's true. We are, but, but we all not need to be cognizant too, right? That we need the sewer plant. I mean, so that's yeah, why so, we. That's yep. why it was done years ago. Right. You need to have uh, a yep. sewer if you want to have a downtown. If yep. you want to have, uh, you know, no, a, great a health to also town. for those of us. You know, I'm I'm so I'm on septic. Right? So it's that's uh, about two. Did you say about two years? It's two years the worth. If you take the feet. highest year, the last four years. So we'd have which a two-year year abatement. Two, I would ask for a two-year moratorium. We can do that, right, Randy? I mean, a moratorium. Sure, as long as the sewer commission goes for it. Yep. I just, I'm still not sure it's an ARCA thing as opposed to a budgetary thing. But that's... Yeah. Well, well, I think from a economic development point of view, which is clearly part of ARPA, to me that hits it. Oh, yeah, I'm not saying it doesn't right, hit it, but right. like Hillary said, there's there's things that are really COVID related that we don't want to. Well, I'm to. I'm going to yeah. kind of say, Mike, the health of the of the residents because of those that haven't connected that have uh, or businesses that haven't connected, uh, that's a health issue. No, I'm not I'm not saying you could justify it. I'm not saying you can't justify it. I'm just saying that as Hillary said, I'd like to get all you know look at some of the other things next week and kind of look at see what we got money left for. But, um, I'm, I mean, I'm all for it. I don't this is. It's a it's an environmental issue, if nothing else, getting people off their septic. Correct. Yeah, we need we need industrial space. I look for 
three years before I finally decided to build because mm -hmm. there's nothing. We need well, Joe, I like, I like if you could hold your motion to next time because this just came up this, this time and how our normal practice has been. We, we review it. it. This yeah. one's only been once. We review it and then we come back. All right, I'll, I'll come if back could, to that with the thank cameras next. Okay. Week. Yep. Thank you. What do other communities do? That have sewers. Yeah. Do they have these kind of charges for their? So other other ones depends on communities. Other ones have charges. Other ones have abatements. Right. Uh, other ones run a whole different gambit of of uh, you know different services, different right. ways. I like to look for a longer term solution and consider this as something we talk about ongoing in the budget as a way of continually, continually helping our businesses and ultimately our families. I'm not keen on the ARPA money going there. I wish it had come up on the list a few million back. I might have felt different. But now with hardly anything left in the, pl in the plan, it's a little worrisome. Well, there is a bit of a downside to having it in the budget all the time because it is a cost. Well, as you will it's see, it's a burden, not a cost, though, a burden. Katie, Katie as, as, as you, as you guys will borne see. by people who don't benefit from it. That's how some people look at as, it. As you, we're a town. We're a whole town. As you will see when we present the budget, there are tremendous headwinds that we all need to be cognizant of. Mm -hmm. For instance, real quick, right? Just one thing. So your ambulance is now going to go fully paid. Hmm. You're going to see that that's going to be an $800,000 swing. Yeah. One thing. Mm-hmm. Let's also take a look at energy costs that have gone up about 30 some percent. So I'm going to tell you right now, that's going to be another $300,000 differential. Right. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen, that thing right there, two things I just told you, is going to be over a million dollars. So that's, to the taxpayer. One, of the, that's, that's just one of the reasons things. to look at this funding because so, we have the So that's the why we need to look at creative ways, right, right? creative ways yep. to offset and to also grow. But it's entirely up to the council how they might choose okay. to want to so use this money. I'd like to consider a longer range plan. That's all. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it, it is a budget item, but if you have more people hooking up, you have revenue continuously. Correct. So right. right. But, but I think right. this does give Absolutely. us a long term Absolutely. solution. And then after two years, when you look at the positives, well, so it may I'll be say this. Uh, here's, a, here's one point we've never done an abatement. So, to be frank, we don't know how it would be, what it really would mean. I mean, we all think that everybody, like you would hook up, okay? But I mean, we've never done it. So there is something to be said for, yeah. for doing it as a, you know, a, 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 a short time period, like you said, for a couple of years, this will cover two years and see how that goes. I mean, we may be amazed by it, but that's something we can think about. Absolutely. We'll talk about it again. Okay, so uh, the police department, the yep. four medical kits. So I'm speaking with uh, Donna from our ambulance. She was talking about defibrillators. Mm -hmm. Where are they and how do we have? So the police department, we're looking for the external de defibrillators and uh, the medical kits. And those uh, are 10,246.88. And that's good. So we can bring that back up uh, to the council at the next meeting. Right. Okay. Uh, item 14, uh, Parks and Rec. Uh, you're going to talk about, we're going to take some action on your recreation fees. So before Dan um, gets into uh, the fees themselves, which were approved by the, by the board, correct, Dan? Yes, they were approved by, they were proposed by the Park and Rec subcommittee. Do we have a copy of that? And then approved by the whole commission. So, oh. yeah, there is. It was in there. But one of the things before Dan gets there was uh, really? Councilman Lawson at the time, and he also brought that up tonight too, yes, was right. the thoughts of the seniors all getting free stickers. There it is, 14. And David come up with an amount of about $6,000 to do that. So I asked Dan, I said, Dan, everything seems like a great idea. There's unintended consequences. Can you project for me, if we were to do that, what the actual cost would be to offer uh, every senior a free park pass. So I'd like to hand this out so we can review that first. And mind you, as we're doing this, there is a mechanism that seniors that cannot afford the 20, is it $20? $20 for seniors. The $20 fee, they can actually go to Park and Rec 
and request a waiver. And Dan, it's pretty simple, right, to do that? Yeah. Yes. And last year there was there was also. Um, Don't they just go into the office and ask? Yeah, and we can okay. we can so, either help them with social services or the. So Dan, center. if you could if you could walk us through this real quick, so. Uh, in 2021, the Senior Center gave out 47 stickers for seniors 60 and over for a total of 1,030. Park and Rec sold 310 stickers to seniors at 20 for a total of 6,200. There were 357 senior tickets sold for $7,200. The cost of the stickers that we would need for these, right, for just the ones that you're talking about now is $3,073.69. Now, here's where we get to the proposal. There's an estimated 7,000 senior citizens, 60 and over. If you're gonna offer this free, you gotta offer it to every single senior. Mm -hmm. If we gave out seniors to every single senior, we were looking at the following. 7,000 stickers minus the 357 sold is 6,643 seniors. The cost of 6,643 RF DI stickers would be 60,000 $916.31. Also, because you're going to have a lot more people uh, at Len Deming, this is what Dan said we're gonna need, additional uh, uh, security. Guard. security. Yeah. You're gonna need to hire one additional security guard, eight hours times 100 days at $20.50. So an additional $16,400. We're gonna need an additional park manager four hours, seven days a week, 14 weeks, and $19.63. That's additional $7,694.96. Can have the additional lifeguard coverage because we're gonna need more, right, Dan? Because there are gonna be a lot more people, probably at maximum. And another thing we have to figure out too, well, well that's down here a little bit lower. Seven hours, seven days, 14 weeks, at $16 an hour is $10,966. As Dan says, this may cause the park to reach capacity limits, which is 214 standard, eight handicapped, accessible 14 trailer parking spots. This would force us to close the park and turn away other residents who may have a paid sticker. This may cause additional stress on the park, such as an additional maintenance and cleaning, septic and well issues, et cetera. And so again, additional cost, RFDI sticker 64,190, security 16,400, Park manager, 7,694.96. Lifeguard, 10,976. Maintenance overtime, 4,105.53. So the additional cost would be approximately $103,366.49 plus loss of revenue. Can I speak on this? Because I, I, I was gonna support Mr. Lawson on, on saying, listen, why don't we waive that vehicle sticker fee of $20 for senior citizens for a two-year period. We're spending ARPA money on, on everything on the face of the earth. And Dan, I got to tell you, you uh, based on what the mayor just gave us, you first of all, we got to find a cheaper sticker. I can't believe we can't get a sticker to put on a car for a senior that doesn't cost that kind of money. If there are 7,000 people in the town of New Milford, over to what, age of 60, and I don't know, we, at one point here we're doing it at 65, but you decide to give us 7,000 people at 60, and I'll admit, I'm in that group, I didn't reach the 65 mm -hmm. yet, but I'm in that group. I won't buy a sticker this year, I'll save you that money on that one. 7,000 people are gonna turn around and go out to all our parks. Most of these senior citizens, if they're in partnerships or relationships, it's two people in a car. Mm -hmm. If grandma and grandpa want to take their kid to the, uh, their grandkids to the park for the day, we are going to see that kind of increase in population. I think that's a little over exaggeration to make a point here, where maybe we could save our senior citizens at 65 and over a few dollars for two years. I mean, I, I, this is. I think this is embarrassing to, to, to make this kind of argument here. That's a worst. If we have 7,000 people in the town, they're all going to hit our parks. I'm just saying that's a worst case scenario. That worst case, that's an impossible scenario. Well, that's what, what that you is. said, impossible. Now, clearly not every senior it, over 60 is going to go to the park. But this is, as you say, a worst case scenario. But why did we do, what would the number be from 65 a month? I mean, it's only five years. Well, the here. senior center, uh, senior senior we go by there. Bucks their uh, criteria right? well why do we sell stickers right now 310 to people 65 and over are we 
not treating people between 60 Dan? and 65? Um, the park, yeah, we, we sell, uh, the Park and Rec Commission considers a senior 65 and older. That, okay, okay. The senior center. But the senior center is younger. Yes. So. Yeah, but, all right, so whose rule are we going to use? The senior centers or, or your, for, for, for giving people free stickers for two years? That's my argument. Well, which number are we going to use? 60, 65. What? At 60, I'll qualify, so maybe I should take myself out of the vote here. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in that middle range there. I'm proud of it, actually. But um, I, I, worst case, you, we can't even get to half the worst case scenario. Are you going to tell me 3,500 seniors are going to start hitting the parks this summer if we give them free stickers? And you know what, though? And are they I there? I don't care for... what the cost is. If a senior can't afford a sticker, there's a way to get it free. Right. We've right. said that. But right. I don't even know. It's, it's a, a courtesy, courtesy to them. them. It's a courtesy. Well, it's a nice finish. thing to do for our community. Let me finish. It is a perk at twenty dollars. It's it's half. It's over. It's a third the price. It doesn't make sense that we're even talking about this, this every year. Every year it comes up. It's stupid. There's a lot of seniors that can afford the stickers, and the one that can't can go out and, and get away if get less expensive. Don't we hear from our seniors every year how how they're on limited incomes in this town? Correct. And those can go see them and get it discounted. At our, at our at my club, we have two rates: a regular rate and a senior rate. We're not going to give the seniors a free rate. What? We you're, give them a discounted rate. You're a private organization. This is a public. Uh, this is embarrassing. I'll tell yeah. you that that's what this is embarrassing. I'd, I'd say that we Please. should take that fee out for two years. I, I wholeheartedly disagree. I'm not embarrassed at all. They are getting a very good value. You know, you know what the the wealthiest demographic in the country is? Mm -hmm. 65 to 74. Now that doesn't mean there aren't seniors that are you in think limited that, again, incomes. You're talking let about let the next year. How about New Milford? Can I finish? That doesn't mean there aren't people with limited incomes who need help. We have, we give them the opportunity to help. There is not a senior in this town who can't get access to a sticker because they can't afford it. It doesn't exist. I don't think this is not a problem in our town. And, right. and I think the fact that we're wasting so much time on this Every year because it's do. like Every a problem. Yeah, it's just, do, do you know what? And I'll say this and then I'll be done for, for the evening because I, I think this is embarrassing. But nonetheless, this these aren't fees. What they are is when a town collects money from someone, just the, as we did over at the Board of Ed, when we collect money from the students for those parking spaces, that's a tax. We tax our students. We're taxing our seniors more here again. And um, I will stop because we're going to be here. I won't vote to go past 10 o'clock. Because yeah. I don't think if we can't get it done by 10. It's 10.30. Oh, I wouldn't vote to go past Jim. 10. But this, this is, you yeah. heard my point of view on this. Yes, go ahead. Tax the seniors. Concerning the fees? Um, do you want me to go down through the list? Okay. Well, just just we can read it. We see that we're Could increasing them on everybody. Can I question, Dan, before you move on to the other ones? You do have people who come in and ask for a sticker free of charge, correct? Correct. Okay, so it does work, the system works. Yes, last okay. year the Senior Thanks. Center had numerous stickers and they gave away 47. Thank you. Well, still, we got a way to put a 7,000. No. Okay, does okay. anybody have, have any but questions on this? Do you see how no, you're trying to make an argument no. here, Mr. Mayor? Oh, I don't like the argument. Of, about the, the gross numbers that we're trying to- I don't agree with the argument. I just don't think there's a need. So, Dan. You raised the price of the, uh, let's talk about somebody who has a boat versus a senior. And I'm not saying everybody has a boat is like overly wealthy, just saying that we, you did put the launch pass up five bucks. Correct. And comparative, Dan, to the other. What are they charging the, Brookfield? The, the other areas, where are we? For, are you talking about boat slips or launch? launch? Bo yeah, boat slips. slips. Boat slips, okay. Comparative um, to the other marinas. Um, New Fairfield is sixteen seventy-five. Oh my gosh! Uh, Sherman, they didn't get back to me yet. Fair, let's see. Um, Brookfield. Brookfield doesn't have slips. Oh. Uh, only private. Um, Danbury doesn't have slips. Um, then I went to private. I checked on some private. Uh, Gerard's is mm. twenty-five hundred this year. How, how quickly do you sell out? Huh. Usually in the first, we usually put it out, and we usually have a few slips all available, probably a dozen, and then um, within a month or so, they're all gone. So supply and demand sounds like we're in a good spot. Yeah. It's <laughs> all that matters for the slips. Does anybody else have any questions concerning the fees? No, you said these, these were pretty constant. These were all approved by the Park and Rec 
board. Yes, unanimous. But I, I just, there's another comment I'm going to make. The stickers, okay? So I have one. I do think it's kind of expensive. I realize they need to be a certain type and they need to last. But I'll tell you one thing. They're almost impossible to remove from your windshield. <laughs> no, really and truly. And I don't, you know, once the summer's over, I don't really need it anymore. It helps me find my car in the parking lot because I feel I'm the only one Are there. you talking about the colored stickers? Or no, the white that ones? that silvery RFID. Yeah, and that's meant to... If Stay they forever. try to remove them, they will tear if somebody tries to steal it or put right. it on another yep, vehicle. Obviously, but you can't get it off. Yeah. So just something to think about that you're paying for these stickers. Over top of the old one. You can't. It won't <laughs> Any stay. other discussion on the fees? I don't yeah. want to belabor this either, but um, I agree with Mr. Faya as far as the argument is concerned. If a senior were to ask for a sticker, it should be received. I don't think 7,000 people will ask. It would be a nice thing to do for seniors because we need to encourage them to get out and do more. Um, so I'd like to support just not charging them a fee. Everyone else is paying and you're raising the prices on everything else. Why can't we take care of some senior citizens? Well, you have to bring that back to the park and rec because they're the ones that set the fees. So if you'd like to ask Dan for them to go do that, you can do that. But they can get it for free. See, that's the thing I just find this is, the, you know, it's sort of, we're not paying and, attention to it here. And, and another thing quickly, Randy, if we give the fees, if we give uh, the seniors free, right? Does that mean, in your opinion, all of them? Yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, so again, so, so, just, so just real quick, just so everybody, because I know we're, we've had some heated exchanges here, but just how the process works. So we understand the process at Lindeming, because there is a process. You can't go in there without a permit. That's for everybody. Okay? It's for everybody. Right. Okay, well, you need a sticker. Okay, so, okay, no so the question would be, okay, there's a cost for the sticker to put on the car. Okay, so even if you were going to say half, if there's a senior and a spouse, so it says 7,000, it's 3,500. You still have to get those stickers to put on those cars. I'm saying that regardless of whether you pay for one or you get it for free, you still need to obtain the sticker. Correct. And have it on your vehicle. Correct. I can't believe that it would be that many more people because it's a free sticker. What it I'm saying be. is. It's just an exaggeration. Uh, what, exactly. What I'm saying is it would be something the town could do for its citizens. It's just if they ask and they're going to use it, they get the sticker, done with it. But if you, feel, if you guys felt this way, why weren't you at, why weren't you at the, the um, park and rec meetings to discuss it? Because that's where it's decided. It's yeah. not uh, excuse me, at the council, don't we have the final say on these things? Of, of, yeah, but not individually, at the, as a whole thing. This is well, I, I'm speaking as a councilman for everybody somewhere between 60 and 65. Well, I'll speak for the ones that are older than that. <laughs> and I know people who can't afford it. And I know two people who did what I suggested. They went into the office, and that was very pleasant. This isn't like, you know, you're made to feel embarrassed. And just said, look, I'm on a limited income, and I'd really like to use the park and, and Addis Park because uh, I like to go there. And uh, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes later, they had their stickers. So uh, I think that the way we do it works. Yeah. You know, and, that's and just I my opinion. With a user fee, people who use the park and then uh, help pay for the maintenance of it because use uh, creates maintenance. So, and a very small user fee. Yeah, seniors, say, I think it's very These user fees aren't covering them. <laughs> that much of the cost you of the know, park. I don't handle that one day. I'm going there quite a bit. There's a Fort Fiesta coming in with the 15 people getting out of the car. <laughs> That's right. That's a miracle that I've never seen so quite some time. So if we take care of that business. So I would like to move that we accept the parks and recreation fees as presented for 2022. Second. Any other discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Okay. Taylor, you were just. Who just? I was for it. David was making a motion to, to you spend our okay, funds so, on it. Uh, uh, Alex and Joe, right? Okay. Two? All right, good. Uh, All right. Item number 15 Sullivan Farm. Uh, we'd like to approve the job descriptions for the farm crew supervisor and assistant farm manager 
that we already discussed that would be funded for uh, with the ARPA funds. Does everybody remember that? Yep. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, it's been Mark. nice seeing you. <laughs> nice seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Greg? Greg? Thank you, Dan. Can you give the council an update? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Greg. That was a nice update. Good evening. The audit presentation is scheduled for this Wednesday at 7 o'clock in the E. Paul Martin. All of your audit, audit reports are available in the mayor's office. The budget process is progressing as the mayor and I have been meeting with departments to discuss their requests. Those discussions will wrap up this week after which the mayor and I will be, be preparing the mayor's recommended budget. <clears throat> Revenues. Revenues are at 53.6% of budget. On a straight line basis, we would expect to be at 50%. Tax collections are at 57.2% of budget overall, with current taxes at 57.7%. Both interest income and stiff interest are running at 36% and 27.8% respectively. Most departments are averaging above the straight line calculation with the exception of health, aging, and the max. The effect of COVID-19 has been detrimental to the ambulance's ability to attract and secure enough volunteers to effectively operate at a service level to satisfy demand. As a consequence, the ambulance is unable to subsidize the debt for the ambulance facility this year or any future year going forward. Therefore, the town will not be receiving $187,250 that was budgeted for this current fiscal year. I have not included that revenue source in the budget for next fiscal year. I do expect to cover that shortfall with an excess of revenue from the supplemental motor vehicle line as well as a reimbursement of a grant for the replacement of inefficient diesel trucks for which we recently received $108,000. Expenditures. Expenditures on a cash basis are at 50% of budget, so we're right on target. I see no issues with expenditures at this point in time, with the exception of tax rebates and refunds, which are at 78.2 expense uh, expended as of December. Unemployment compensation is running significantly significantly under budget with only 3.2% of budget expended. In summary, on a cash basis, revenues are at $56,376,111.26 and expenditures are at $50,078,000 $923.49, leaving the town with a positive cash flow of $6,297,187.77 for the first half of this fiscal year. Okay. Questions? Is there a good shape? Yes. Well, now we're in. January where we're collecting our second half of tax revenue. Right. So is that about the norm? I mean, we're right. To the I end think of the we're month. about one and a half percent ahead of tax collections than we were at this time last year. Good. But don't you have to show a revenue loss to use it as capital capital improvements? Or so do you not it's, have it's a there was a final <laughs> ruling that came out from the feds. Okay, so they changed. And the final Correct. ruling says 
that you can take a standard calculation, and this is across America, of $10 million. So therefore, New Milford is getting $8 million. So anything that we do qualifies under the revenue loss Even calculation. Even if we haven't lost revenue. Even if you haven't lost revenue, well, they they make it when they made these calculations, mm -hmm. they did this not considering New Milford. They considered, uh, you know, Detroit, Michigan, and mm -hmm. they did, you know, the large city, and they painted with a broad brush mm -hmm. when they made these. Okay. So, um, in okay. Connecticut, we have a two and a half percent spending cap. So. You know, even if we adhered to the 4.1% revenue loss, we'd still have that spread that anything could okay. uh, Thank you. qualify. So uh, now with the final, uh, the final ruling, everything that we spend is, is, is eligible under the revenue loss calculation. Good. Thanks, Greg. Any other questions for Greg? Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. Uh, quickly, item 17, this is a road closure pending approval of the Traffic Authority. Uh, this is to uh, Sergeant Zach Scholler and Anthony and Tracy Morrissey. It's they're requesting to close Youngsfield Road over to Medinstill from 7.15 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. and Church Street 6 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. on Sunday, August 28, 2022, with a rain date of September 4th, 2022. This is for a... Uh, race for Brian Cody's law. Do you have a second? Second. Mike Any Mayhem. discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, Mayor, update on economic Thank you. development. Very, very quickly on economic development. We can continue to see strong, uh, as I said before, strong growth in our permit process. Some of the projects that are uh, uh, in some form of uh, breaking ground, you have the car wash uh, over uh, uh, with uh, Cumberland Farms. You have the Popeyes and Ben and Jerry's that is by uh, the Dunkin' Donuts there uh, by Dodd Road. You also have going to be a child care center that's gonna be in Litchfield Crossings. You have a new gym that's gonna be opening up, uh, I know, like by uh, uh, in the old Staples Plaza as well. Uh, on uh, Still River Drive. We've talked about this before. You have Garrity Pump that's going to be putting their headquarters there. You have uh, Built Right that's going to be putting their uh, corporate headquarters on Still River. On the corner uh, by uh, Save a Tree is going to be the new, uh, um, uh, it's a textile a masonry uh, center that's going to be opening up there. Headquarters on the corner. They've already broken ground and working on that go into Pickett District. You have uh, Mr. Brucey's company and uh, Mr. Lasky putting their headquarters on Pickett District as well. Um, you're gonna have the storage facility that is uh, right uh, here on Route 7, uh, kind of semi across the street or next to the brewery. Uh, they're beginning to uh, break ground uh, for spring for there as well. Uh, as far as downtown, uh, 64, my old store, Archway News, is, uh, re is redoing uh, uh, where the woman is being putting in quiches, famous quiches that she does, breads, bubble teas, and Reading whatnot. Room, music. Yep, music across the street. Yeah. Next to play is going to be a char charcuterie. 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 Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, we also know that Mama's Tacos has opened up. Also had, uh, oh yeah, also had El Dente's. They opened up uh, as excellent. well. Excellent. Yep. Excellent. So. Uh, Yep, so with that, um, one of the big things I'd like to talk about is speaking with Mr. Um, Murphy, we're still seeing tremendous demand for solar. Lots of people putting solar on their homes, big, big driver. So uh, it's good to see yeah. that, uh, you know, we have people using solar to reduce their, uh, <coughs> their carbon footprint and also their electric bill, which is, Great. in my opinion, pretty crazy. Great. Okay, that's okay. it for that, yep. Okay, 18B, I'd like to move uh, that we rename the pond at Mariel Brook to Haile Halasikun Pond. pond. Mike, can you come up, please? Is there a second to that? We have a second. second. Thank you. So Mike is uh, with the Conservation Commission. 
And uh, when I was there, they made a very big suggestion. As Adam has been uh, with the, uh, in a form, one form or another, helping the town. And oh my gosh, Here's decades and decades, yeah. and decades, decades and decades. I'm Michael Bird. I live at Five Century Hill Lane. And I'm on the Conservation Commission, and this is our new Conservation Commission Chairman. In so, I'm Andrew McPhee, and I'm at 178 Indian Trail Road. Andrew, what was your name? Andrew McPhee. Ah, welcome. Thank you. So Adam has been here since 1954, when his fi family bought that property. His father was instrumental in redoing the dam. If you, Mary O'Brook, if you look on it on Google Maps, go to the space photograph of it, you'll see there's a very large body of water. Yeah. It's almost 3,800 feet long, and it's 605 feet wide. It's a multifaceted, multi-layered environmental zone. So Adam has been on the Conservation Commission since 1987, so that's 34 years. He retired in December. Uh, he is also an Army veteran with 28 years of service, two years and 15 months in Vietnam. He retired there as a lieutenant colonel. So we thought it would be an appropriate thing for his service to this town and to this nation that we named the pond after his family. It's private property. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, there is a legal precedent for doing it because if you go to Bethlehem, if you go to Wood Creek Road, you'll find Bird's Pond, <laughs> which was done before him. So it's something that could be done. And Randy, uh, I had asked you your opinion. Can we do this? Absolutely. Okay. So, so it would be named on maps heretofore. Right. It's It'll a, be named on maps. It, you know, people it. will be able, it's still private property, so you right. basically can't get there, but <laughs> you know, it, it's there. And but it's, it's something, nice you know, to, 200 years, yeah. like me, I can go 200 years from my ancestors and say it's Bird's Pond. And it'll be named after his family. It's a nice way to commemorate. Yeah, it's a, nice, it's a nice thing to do for a gentleman who has served his country all his life. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's Good. right. Very good. But we have a motion, Katie. We do. We have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you Thank so you. much. And welcome, Andrew. Good luck. Thanks. Uh, item 19A, uh, discussion and possible action on Chernesky Bridge Project. And I think but this, we already, we already we talked about that, so that. we'll have that at the next meeting. All right. Uh, update and discussion of possible action on the Long Mountain Scenic Road Subcommittee. Jack? Um, you had formed a uh, scenic road committee for the Long Mountain, the uh, double yellow line striping on, and uh, guardrail installation on Long Mountain Road. The committee consists of Andrew Harvey, K Kevin Ume, Chris Cosgrove, David Lawson, Paul Murphy, Frank Warga, and myself. Um, I no women were available, I guess, huh? I'm sorry, what? Nothing. Oh, I missed out. <laughs> Tired. Anyway. Um, the committee met several times. I, sum I gave the mayor a report. I'm not sure if he gave you a copy of it. If not, I can read it to you. Um, can you read it, Jack? I'm sorry, I'll read it. Yeah, the Scenic Road Committee completed its review of two requested actions, painting of double yellow center lines and the installation of a guardrail for Long Mountain Road number four and offering the following comments. One, the committee reviewed the, com the question of painting double yellow line center lines on this section of Long Mountain Road. The committee met with residents at the corner of Hind Road and Long Mountain Road to discuss the proposed changes. Part of the discussion centered on the traffic authority's decision to paint the double yellow center lines and the town attorney's opinion indicating the liability the town would incur if it did not follow their decision. Several re residents indicated they were intending to ask the traffic authority to revisit their decision. On November 23rd, the traffic authority again ruled to have the lines painted. Therefore, the committee followed their decision. The second uh, point is the committee reviewed the Department of Public Works request to install 200 feet uh, gar of guardrail along the north side of the road, west of the intersection of Hind Road. They reviewed the three alternative mat available materials, galvanized, brushed, or powder coated, and wood. The committee approved the installation of a brushed slash powder coated guardrail. The Scenic Road Committee submits this report respectively to the Town Council. Jack, can I get a copy? Of the, do you have a copy I can have? Over there? Thank you. Yep. And also, Katie, okay, before I might, before we do this, we also had some uh, residents um, asked to have these uh, 
given to the minutes. We have one from Jessica Stellato. That's a copy. We have one from uh, Jonathan Meyer. We have another one from Jerry Friedman. That's another copy, copy. And Lucia Walsh. We can put those in the minutes. So I have a question, Jack. Because um, we've talked about this before, but I also think that it is rather compelling some of the things that have been said by the people who live there and the studies, and particularly uh, Andrew's uh, research on accidents, and scenic roads versus other roads. Was that um, taken into consideration and studied? And I know you're going to tell me that was in another part of the country or whatever, or another country, but um, do we really have to have a double line? Well, let me first start. The answer to your question is all the information from Andrew and from the Public Works Department was disseminated to everybody in the committee. Everybody had access to all that information. No, I know we did. I'm talking about the people you had that looked at this, the uh, the scenic road. Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying, the scenic road oh, committee. Oh, I thought you meant us. Wait, no, no, no. I'm, I'm pointing to, to Chris because Chris was on the scenic road committee. Yep, yeah, we all got access yeah. But I also need to go back to the fact about the, the, the yellow line. Um, it, it, the road had a single line on it prior to us paving it. For a long time. It does. The only center lines are considered what they call markings. Markings are governed by the Office of State Traffic Authority. They delegate that responsibility to the local traffic authority. The addition or removal of any yellow line, of any center line has to be ruled on by that agency, by that authority. And that's why originally when we did the road over, we, we probably weren't going to, we, we were working on it and the, and the municipal road committee came and recommended to us that we have the line repainted at a certain point. You can no longer use a single yellow line. The, the MUTCD does not allow that. So at that point we went, you know, we went to the scenic road, we went to the um, traffic authority in act I think it was October, November 2020 and we brought it before them and they ruled that you should put you you need to put the line on the road because somebody somewhere has a regulation that's that's the original intent yes but it's the town road isn't it it is a town road but the state it's like many things there's a list of uh, of activities signs uh, yeah yeah i get that but is it in our rules and regulations is it in our code that we have to have this line it's not covered by the town. It's, it's governed by the state traffic authority. I see. And did they show up and say this? Did somebody ask them to come? Well, no. Because or they you're just abiding by what they say. They delegate that to the, to the local traffic authority. But you're saying since there's a line before, we'd have to actually get permission to get rid of the line. And since the rules now say you have to have double lines, we have to have a double line instead of a single yeah. line. Right. The local, because yes, they the paved the road. The local traffic authority has that responsibility. Well, I have to say, in my personal experience, that they're, they're not necessarily consistent in what they do. I live on a road that I consider it sort of scenic, once you get past the mobile home park, but <laughs> it was paved. It didn't have any line forever and ever, and it got paved and it didn't get a line right away. I, I, don't, I, I just think it's a happen, happenstance sort of situation, and you have a, a bunch of people in a beautiful area who are upset about this, uh, I don't. The, I don't know why we can't. The key for me, Katie, as a council person on this was, um, you know, I, I'm going to show up with an automatic kind of bias towards whatever our municipal roads committee and and that says, unless I see something significant that they've missed. And the data uh, that Andrew brought forth, while interesting. I, only one of them was for U.S. based, uh, I don't care. and, and, and it wasn't. Traffic. It, it wasn't a peer-reviewed study, and we have um, uh, advice from town attorney that says if we, as a committee, were to override our traffic authority, we could be liable. Okay, our traffic of, authority consists of people with experience in in what way that they should know that this is right or wrong. It's just like us. I They're mean, following statutes that say that there's a line. I'm going by our town attorney that no, says I'm if asking, we override them. 
we we could be held liable. But this all them. came to a point because somebody on the this somebody decided that oh we paved it so now it doesn't have a line. I guess we better put. I two. mean, it went back twice to the traffic authority. Well, they reviewed it twice. Well, good for them. But I guess I'm at I'm at you're not part of the traffic authority. I know that. No. So I mean, I, I haven't checked their bios either. Well, I might want to, but I I just think that you. We want. We just already heard so many comments over so many things about the scenic, the beauty of our town, scenic roads. I have lived here forever, and you've lived here a long time. What draws people here? Rural safety. Rural. We know this, Mayor. We talk about this all the time. Why people want to be in the best town in the USA. So we have this nice little road, and people are happy to have it the way that it was, and to keep safety for but it their. Did have a line on it. Yes, but now that it got paved, and now you're going to put two lines, you're going to even make it more, less of a side, I don't call it sidewalk, what do you call it, a walk right away or whatever. Um, so they have little kids, or you walk your dog. I, I don't know, I, I, think, I think we're overdoing it a little bit for a tiny little thing in, in a beautiful place. That's just my opinion, I'm entitled to it. And I really think that sometimes we ought to take a look at the, any, I'm not just picking on the traffic authority, but on a lot of boards and commissions because what Andrew said is a common thought that they you know they come with a preconceived idea that hey this is what we do and I hate to see that this is happening for something that's so nice because that means that there would just be other roads like that and I'm glad to see we're going to have a scenic road advisory committee but I don't know are they going to be up to the charge to really think about it and be talented enough Mm -hmm. You're pointing if at me. If there's no line on a road, do we have a, a legal problem? No. Jack, Randy? No, you do not. The, the law is, is if you're going to line the road, you can no longer use a single line. You don't have to line the road. You know there was a line before. It, no, it? you do not. That is a discretionary act. Unless a higher authority orders it lined and you disobey it. Then all that does is it removes your immunity, governmental immunity. Right. If there's an accident, it doesn't. You don't get hit. Nobody, nobody yells at you. The, the fact right. is, is that that's what that means. It doesn't automatically mean you're liable for anything that happens there. Right. But if there's going to be a line, it has to be a double line. And what higher authority, Jack, said we had to have a line? I think I started out the, saying uh, this. The uh, traffic authority. And somebody brought them up there and said we had to have it. No, the, the line was there, and the only people who can remove it is the traffic authority. But you removed it. You paved over it. Well, didn't have fun in the back. <laughs> that, that's, 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 that's part of the process, you know, and then we're responsible for putting it back. This is going to be a cartoon somewhere. <laughs> it's not if you live there, and, I, you know, I, I, I'm really, uh, I don't live there, but I know the road, and I don't, I'd hate to see it happen, and I'd hate to see it happen to some other road. And I think uh, by coming up with this advisory committee. So you're saying, Jack, there's nothing can be done. Well, the traffic authority can change. Well, you not, not line it. You could not line it. What, what they're asking for is to not have it be double line the, or the, single line in the best case. But and to really go to the traffic authority to see if they would be okay with removing the line. <laughs> Which we, they've done twice. The, and they said no. Is it is that the rationale? I mean, I wasn't. Yes. Is there and and I heard Safety. when I was driving. Really? As I said, I heard when I was driving in, and this is stuff you, we've gotten frustrated during COVID. Is is a lot of rules are being made based on these the safety and, and and stuff like that. Yet I we haven't seen that that data that actually says the yellow lines either improve for accidents or make it worse because people realize they can go faster when there's yellow lines. I, I'd love to see that data that they use to make that decision. Well, I think the traffic authority, we, we, you know, waits to hear recommendations made to them. The recommendation made to them by both the Municipal Road Committee and the Department of Public Works was to, you know, continue with the uh, with the yellow line. There was a lot of back and forth between us and Randy. Um, there's ten people in Public Works who looked at this and gave me their recommendations, and we supplied that to the traffic authority. Okay. What is the timing on this? I must say that I don't have any information on it. I mean, what I've heard tonight is what I've heard, but I don't have the report that was done from several people who've spoken. 
who I think did report. So I don't know. I feel like I'm well, ill. It started to... a while ago. Okay. Yeah, but me, I, well, I guess what I'm Andrew's saying is, been here what's the time. timing as far as decision? Like, what's the rush or not rush or? Well, we're not going to paint any lines right now. Uh -huh. uh, so we, you know, it's not. We probably won't paint lines until May or June. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we can, and we as a council can override them. No. You, you, yeah, you have the authority to override. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, you have the power to do that. You're, you're the superintendent of, of, of affairs. I'm just telling you, you lose your immunity if something happens and somebody alleges that it was a, it happened because it wasn't adequately marked. Gotcha. That doesn't mean you're going to be liable. It means you lose that automatic immunity. I don't like that. So even if it's a scenic road, you cannot play that game with the uh, words scenic and stuff like this? That one's not designated scenic, is Jack, it? if you change the speed yes. limit on, on the road, road is, is a scenic does that road. change anything? What's the speed limit on that road? The speed limit uh, for scenic roads is 25 miles an hour. So it's 25, and if you made, no? I guess so, no. It's 30. <laughs> it's according to Andrew, it's 30 miles an hour. Okay. But if it's 25 is what you're saying, is there, if it was lower, would that change anything? Suppose it was 20. Depend, you know, the, the guidance Does it that change we, anything in the guidelines if it's slower? We, um, when we looked at the reports, the reports say to, that it recommends markings on roads, uh, particularly as the uh, age of, of residents starts to get older, they, the lines are there to help them negotiate that in bad weather. That's one of the, that's one of the studies. I, you know, we've looked at a lot of studies too. I mean, there's studies both ways. I know. Right, but the age of the people on the road, I mean, they're, they're all over the place. I know somebody yeah. lives on the road that's really old, and I know somebody who's really young, and who do you go with? Are there other, in other areas of Connecticut, are there other bodies that have created, you know, pushback on this, you know, authority that's telling you you have to do it? Meaning, are there other, you know, dirt roads that have, um, that can get out of the legal bind? So there might be some pushback on what we're hearing from, from I can answer that. It did happen in Sherman. It happened, but it didn't happen with lines. It happened with guardrails in yeah. Sherman. Sure. Okay. And this is so. obviously the paid portion of Long Mountain, not the dirt part. Portion. Right, right. But maybe <laughs> there's maybe there's something there that can. There. So, what is the action that you want to take on the subcommittee? The, the the way that the ordinance is written, we have to submit this to the town council for your review. So what's the, I'm asking again, it says here, update discussion and possible action on the Long Mountain Scenic Road Subcommittee. What's the action that we're to take? It has to be presented to the council. And what you just presented to us. Yes. Correct. Right? Do we have to Randy? vote to accept yeah. it or anything? Or? Yeah. yeah. No. Is that it? No. Okay. Can we, could I have Andrew make a statement Absolutely about Absolutely you can. Because he um, knows it better than I do. I'm just wondering if you have the uh, uh, um, Minari report included in your packet. I have submitted this. Right. I have copies of it which I. I don't think so. Can you hand them all the copies? Yeah. Down I don't believe so. No, I don't have. So that. there's nothing to support. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and Andrew, you sent this to the town council, correct? I sent it to you and to uh, Linda. Pat, Linda. Yeah. I got you. Thank you. Okay. I know I've seen it, but I don't know if I got it because I was on the subcommittee. You probably got it because you're on the subcommittee. I'd like to um, to table this this, mm -hmm. this decision. Yep. Um, I'd like a chance to read this, There's and no I. Decision. Yes, we have to. Uh, There's no decision right now. I, I just. I just asked you, and you said yes because no, it says no, possible you, action. You take this as a report, but if you have to take action to move. Okay. To then, to. Uh, then we just have a, the, We have another so clerical issue on our agenda because it says we need to take action. So we're just accepting this to read it. You're not lining the road now because it's winter. So we can put it on the agenda in a month or so and, and discuss it again if you want. I definitely would like to do yep. that. Actually, I would like the traffic commission to reconsider and, and let's have more dialogue and hear the history of their decision. Can they come to, can we have a talk? Sure. So you, it's not a good idea, but it's good. <laughs> no, maybe we don't. Why not? Maybe we'll find a loophole. No, because every commission has to explain their position. 
Right. Oh, no, I agree with you, Randy. No, but let's just have a chance to percolate on this a little bit. I'd like to read this and think more about it. Hi. If I may. Joe? Um, I spent a career defending people that were involved in automobile accidents, an insurance defense attorney. Um, so I know about road markings and guardrails and safety. Um, and, 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 and importantly, a town attorney has told us that if we attempt to override a committee that's made this recommendation, mm -hmm. um, this one bad car accident up there would bankrupt this town. So or close to it. Well, Joe, I'm not I've normally, seen verdicts in those areas. I would normally never go against something that is a legality thing like that or culpable for the town to have a liability. But I, this has just really been um, an example of, I think, well, I don't want to say what I think. I'm going to finish reading this, but I think we should talk about this in the next meeting or two. What do you think, Mayor? Can we do that? We've got a lot of budget stuff coming up. Yeah, that, that doesn't matter. This is a... There is nothing more important than things that, got, that upset our residents, and that's what we're here for. They vote for us to be here, and maybe it's not a huge item to everybody, but they live there, and it's, a, it's, go, it's every day for them. They drive on the road. They live there. They bought a piece of property to live there and enjoy the rural bucolic setting, and I think... Um, this is something we should not, it's not the only scenic road. There could be a lot of other people come along with this and I'd like to give it considerable thought. So we have we'll this put, it on the, yeah. put it on the next council agenda. Right, and we have a couple new council members who weren't here when this all started. I think they should deserve to hear something, you know, figure it out themselves. Okay. All right. so, so the other last no item. There'll be no action taken right. uh, on this and then, uh, uh, We'll bring it up to the next town council meeting. Is that okay, Jack? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate you. that you, you know, yeah. put you in a bad spot. But um, do we want to do the scenic yep. road advisory? Okay, I'd like yep. to move that we create a scenic road advisory committee. Second. Any second it? Thank you. Second. Any discussion on the scenic road advisory committee? Uh, I'm asking for the town council to do this, as we can. I spoke with Jack as well. This will be residents that will be on scenic roads that will uh, uh, give us their input when it comes to scenic roads whether it be uh, how we maintain them uh, how things are done through the ordinance itself and i think the more that we can be working with our residents i think the better off that it is yep. and i know jack himself when i talked to him was a very big proponent of this as well the more input we can get from our residents i think the better product we'll have is this uh, all scenic roads? Or are we thinking primarily dirt uh, scenic roads? Uh, scenic roads. Mine is scenic scenic road, which would be both dirt and right. those that have a pavement as well. And one thing that has been said here many times, and I, I know the council feels the same way. Look, scenic roads are part of our history here in New Milford. They're part of mm -hmm. who we are, and we need to protect them and make sure that. Uh, they, they maintain their character. The residents purchased up there for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to make sure that we uh, maintain those. It's part of our character. It's part of our heritage here in New Milford. I have one, just yeah. one comment. I'd like to suggest that we um, not just start with this one. It's not just because of this. But we, we really start to think about diversifying some of our committees and um, I know we don't have tons of people jumping out to be parts of boards and commissions and things. However, New Milford, you're here if you're still awake watching. Um, we really could use a, really a few more demographics in some of our committees. Mm -hmm. So, just, just a so we have a motion and a second. Yes, we do. All those in favor? No, we got to first do this one. All those, all those in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Second. Okay, okay. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight.